Hello there. Before we dive into today's special episode, a like would be greatly appreciated if you're enjoying the content. Thank you and I hope you're having a wonderful day. Welcome to the 10th episode of my YouTube journey where we're kicking off our 9-part series, Kevin's in a Big Rig. Today, we're delving into the very first part titled, Kevin Violates Parole, exploring the pivotal events that shaped Kevin's life. Let's get started. A few years ago, I was a driver trainer for a large trucking company. Basically, my job was to take newly minted truck drivers and teach them how to handle themselves in the real world. Sometimes it was easy, other times it was like teaching a fish to play tennis. One of my students, the Kevin of the story, was so dense he made a lead brick seem like a feather pillow. Not because of his driving, but because he almost got himself and me arrested. Here's the story. Kevin was on my truck for about three weeks. He wasn't the worst student I had, another Kevin has that honor, but he was far from the best. At week two, we end up stuck in Salt Lake City, Utah after delivering a load. It was a slow time of year and SLC had always been a sparse area for outgoing loads so I expected to have to wait to leave out. Not a big deal, I needed the downtime. Kevin, from out of nowhere, started to seem anxious about something. When I ask him why he's so tense, he tells me he needs to get his license changed to his home state. He lived in Louisiana but his license was from Iowa. The company used a loophole in Iowa state law by granting temporary residency to students to get them a license. After the license was issued, they had 30 days to get it switched to their home state. Not a major issue since management knew the drill and would get us to students' home state in plenty of time. Dude, Kevin asked, when can we go to Louisiana? I need to get my license changed. He asked this every day for a week, but it wasn't until we were stuck in SLC that has really seemed to bug him. Look, I've told dispatch you need to get home. They'll work it out. Just relax. He didn't. After three days, we finally get to leave SLC bound for Chicago. It takes a few days and the entire trip, I can tell he's getting more and more nervous. Eventually, he can't talk about anything else except how he needs to get home. He was getting pretty annoying. We make our delivery in Chicago and get another going to Laredo, Texas. Normally, we would have gone through Houston, Texas, but this happened during the massive floods and I knew going that way would be a bad idea. Fortunately, I found a way that would avoid the flooding and get Kevin to his hometown. Better still, we would have enough time for him to get a ride to the DMV, get his license changed, and still make delivery in plenty of time. Win win win. And Kevin finally seemed relieved. We get to Kevin's hometown on a Sunday afternoon. As he gets ready to leave, I tell him first thing in the morning, get your ass to the DMV, get your license taken care of and get back here pronto so we can get going. He says okay and leaves with his girlfriend while I enjoy some time to myself. The next morning, I give Kevin until 10 a.m. before I start getting impatient. I texted him asking where he was and got no reply. I text again, again, no answer. I call, no answer. I tell dispatch, who's asking me when we'll get moving, that Kevin has disappeared. He was supposed to get his license changed over, but I haven't heard from him all day. Dispatch tries to call him and they don't have any better luck. Apparently, Kevin has disappeared. By late afternoon, I start getting the feeling this little shit has bailed on me and wasted my time. This was a common occurrence for new drivers. I tell dispatch that'll give him until the morning to reach out. If he doesn't, I'll continue on to Laredo on my own. There was still plenty of time and dispatch agreed. Morning came, Kevin was still AWOL and I was out of patience. I send him one more text telling him I'm leaving without him and head out. I drive for several hours before taking a mandatory break and check my messages. To my surprise, Kevin reached out. Hey, man. My PO found out I took a job driving and was pissed that I left Louisiana. She told me to get back as soon as possible or she would have me listed as a fugitive. I called her yesterday, Monday, but she's out of town and told me to wait till she gets back on Wednesday. I'm completely shocked. PO, as in parole officer. Kevin, are you telling me you're on parole and leaving the state without permission? Yeah, I was in jail for selling dope. I got parole for two years. I didn't think it'd be a big deal since I was working. Dude, you violated your parole. You'll be lucky if you don't end up back in jail. Well, my PO said she wants to talk about it Wednesday. Yeah, I imagine so. You better get in touch with dispatch and let them know so they can work something out. I end the conversation and continue on to Laredo. I deliver the load and pick up another headed to Atlanta, Georgia Thursday. I call Kevin to find out what the deal was. He tells me that his PO gave him the okay to keep working. I assume you have some kind of official document that says that. I tell him. Uh, no. She didn't give me one. 
Then you better get one because there's no way in hell I'm leaving the state with you unless I have something from the state saying it's okay. Uh, why? Because, dumbass, if I carry you across state lines knowing you're violating parole, that makes me an accessory to a felony. I'm not going to jail for your stupidity. Oh, okay. He'll ask her. I tell Kevin when and where to meet me. I tell him that if disappears again, I'm not coming back to get him. He says he understands. I get to the location when I said I would and he's nowhere to be seen. I text, no answer. By this point, my patience for this clown is completely gone. I tell dispatch I don't trust this guy's word and I'm not taking a chance on him lying to me. I leave out again and head for Atlanta. Kevin does reach out six hours later and wants to know if he'll come back for him. I tell him that he has lied three times and acted so shady that I can't trust him to do the right thing. If he wants to finish his training, he can sort something out with management but there's not a chance in hell that he will see me again. Fast forward a few months. I found out from dispatch that Kevin's PO had not given him permission to leave the state again. Apparently, I made the right call by leaving him there. Fortunately, they weren't interested in prosecuting me. I have no idea what happened to Kevin, but I imagine he did something else that was stupid and landed back in prison. As for me, I took a break from training after the whole debacle. This Kevin wasn't the only one I had during my time as a trainer, and he definitely wasn't the worst. But for dragging me into his parole violation, he is firmly in the top 10. This is it for part 1. Moving on to part 2, first day, first Kevin, in our series Kevin's in a Big Rig. Now, we delve into Kevin's inaugural journey behind the wheel. Let's see how he handles his debut on the road. The first Kevin I encountered when I became a truck driver was, by far, the absolute worst. To say that he was dumb as a box of hammers would be insulting to the hammers. Even now, six years later, I can scarcely believe the majority of the things this guy did that ranged from really dude, to oh my god, how can you still be alive being so dumb? The worst part is that I had to share a truck with this guy for early three months, including trying to sleep with him driving an 80,000 pounds vehicle without adult supervision. Please keep that in mind as the story progresses. When I met this Kevin, I'll refer to him as FK for first Kevin, I had just completed my six-week training period with my driver trainer after I received my CDL. The standard policy of the company was to pair two drivers who lived relatively close to one another so that both drivers could take home time at the same time, we typically stayed out on the road for weeks, sometimes months at a time working constantly. Unfortunately for me, FK was the driver that lived closest to me at the time who had no co-driver at the time. So I get paired with FK and the first day I could feel the stupid vibes pouring off of him. I was born and raised in the southeastern US and even to me, calling this guy white trash would be an understatement. He bragged about his family being big in the KKK, but he accepted his driver trainer who was black. But being a new hire and bottom rung of the ladder, I shrugged it off. The first day FK and I are paired up, we pick up a load going to the LA area. FK, thinking that because he has a whopping two weeks more driving experience than I do that he should be the one to take the first shift because I don't trust you yet. I should explain, this was not his personal truck, it was owned by the company and he was not a supervisor of any kind. I didn't care so I rode shotgun for a bit. As soon as FK starts driving, I'm immediately grateful for the driver trainer I had. FK reminds me of my time at CDL school when I would be in a truck with four other students and an instructor. Student truck drivers are notorious for being clumsy behind the wheel, but they tend to find their groove while out with a trainer. FK, on the other hand, thought the bouncing gear changes, excessive revving and braking so hard that a simple four-way stop feels like landing on an aircraft carrier. I wasn't very experienced, so I thought nothing about it for long. We get fuel at a nearby truck stop and head west. Once we're on the interstate, I notice FK keeps picking up a spiral-bound notebook, looking at something, then putting it down. He does this every few minutes for about an hour before I ask what he's looking at. FK gets a shit-eating grin on his face and hands it to me. It's the route the company sent us. You know, since we're company drivers, we have to follow the company route. Ah, uh, okay, so why do you keep looking at it? The next turnoff is at least 200 miles away. Yeah, but I keep forgetting. Note that FK had a perfectly good truck-specific GPS in the truck and the route was programmed in. You program the GPS, right? I ask. Just follow that. It's telling you the same thing as your notes. He mumbles something about how it's so important that we follow the company route or we get written up and he was gonna do everything right and blah blah blah. I just let it go. So we're still going down the interstate, FK driving and religiously checking his precious notebook every five minutes. It's around rush hour and we were in a fairly large populated area. 
I start seeing signs of road construction and traffic is beginning to stack up, but FK is still looking at his notebook and not slowing down. Traffic is quickly becoming bumper to bumper and FK still hasn't seemed to notice. It's then that I see the issue that the two left lanes are closed due to construction. FK is driving in the center left lane of a four lane section of interstate. The far left lane is already closed and the center left, the lane we are currently in, is about to close in less than a mile. FK, still reading his notebook, drives right up to point where the orange barrels mark the start of the lane closure. Dude, get over! I tell him and instinctively check the passenger side mirror to check for traffic. It's then that I notice the other semi, hauling us up on our right side. FK looks up, sees the barrels and no signal, no mirror check, just merges right. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I yell just as the other truck blows past, rearing down on the air horn. I briefly glimpse the other driver's face and he is pissed. Not that I blame him. FK looks sheepish and starts mumbling something about idiot drivers, but at the time I'm still trying to keep from going into full-on heart attack. I stay up front until we clear the construction zone and then climb back in the bunk to get some rest, emphasis on try. I had to drive the night shift and I knew better than to drive without sleep. His less than expert truck handling did not help matters. A few hours later, I wake up to the sound of air brakes releasing. I hear FK yelling he's out of time to drive and I need to take over. I pull my boots on, sign in as the active driver to the truck's electronic log terminal and settle into the driver's seat. It's at that point that I look out through the windshield and see something odd. It's dark, of course, but in the headlights I see two white lines converging at an angle just ahead of the truck. I look to left and the dim reflection of emergency flashers light up cat eye reflectors and a white dashed center line between two solid white right-of-way boundary lines. It's pretty obvious FK, in his lack of wisdom, had stopped the truck right at the merging point of a highway on-ramp and a major highway. Where the F asterisk 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 are we? I demand. I dunno. But I ran out of hours and this was the only place I could find. That was bullshit because there was rest area 10 miles before that would have been a much better place to stop. Dude, do you have any idea how dangerous this is? Not to mention, illegal. Well, I had to stop somewhere. Anyway, I gotta pee. He goes to get out of the truck. No the fuck you don't. I say, pulling on the seatbelt, releasing the brakes, and putting the truck in gear. We are not staying here a second longer. If you have to piss, use a coke bottle. We're out of here. I get the truck going, thanking God there was no traffic or cops at the time, while FK is grumbling about having to pee in a bottle. I don't care because I'm more concerned about not causing an accident or getting a ticket because of this idiot. He can piss in his pants for all I care. He goes straight to the bunk anyway so I don't have to listen to him. I drive the rest of the night without incident and he takes over again early the next morning. These incidents may not seem too bad but bear in mind this happened in just the first day. I was with this clown for three months and conditions did not improve during that time. This concludes part two. Let's move on to part three. Titled, Kevin in a Big Rig Part Three, Frozen. Backstory, the following takes place about a month after first Kevin, FK, and I were first paired up. If you've listened to part two of this series, then you have some idea of the kinds of Kevin-esque things FK was capable of and you'd probably be right. But what he did this time resulted in what the absolute worst night's sleep of my entire life and the closest I ever came to committing legitimate murder. By this point, I already had FK pegged for what he was, an incompetent buffoon who shouldn't be allowed near a soapbox car, let alone an 18-wheeler. But worse, in his obviously demented mind, he thought he was the absolute top dog of the trucking world. This is in spite of the dozens of times he would have to wake me up and get him out of another bad situation. However, at the time, I was more of the grin and bear it mentality because I was broke and afraid that any screw-ups or boat rocking on my part would get me fired. But that was about to change. One day, after picking up a load close to the company's home terminal, we received instructions from dispatch to relay the load in the company's drop yard and take the truck sands trailer to a local dealer in town for scheduled maintenance. This was essentially a glorid oil change and lube job with a few other items on the checklist just to make sure the truck was in good shape. This was normally handled by the in-house mechanics, but because of some serious backlogs, they decided to contract it out. The plan, as relayed by dispatch, was for us to drop the loaded trailer in the yard, bobtail to the dealership for a late morning appointment, get the service done, it would take two hours maximum, pick the backup when finished, and continue on to the destination. Easy in, easy out. Unfortunately, FK was the driver on duty during the shift in which we were supposed to arrive. 
But in typical FK fashion, he got lost because his infamous system of navigation failed again. As a result, he wasted half a day backtracking and ran out of drive time, leaving me to get us to the terminal, drop the load, and get to the dealership 15 minutes before they closed for the day. This meant that, since we missed our appointment, we would have to wait until the next morning when they had an opening in the schedule. Since the opening was first thing that morning and parking at the company terminal was packed, I made the call to park the truck outside the dealership for the night. We had plenty of fuel and there was a gas station within walking distance where we could get food. The shop told us this was fine, so that was that. This happened in around late November slash early December in the Midwest. The winter had already shown signs of being bad and snow had been falling for weeks already. The weather forecast for that night was to dip well below freezing not long after sunset. After squaring everything away with the service reps at the shop, I turned to FK. Look FK, it's gonna get cold once the sun goes down. I'm gonna walk over to the store and grab something to eat tonight. You coming? FK replied, no, I got food. I'm gonna see if I can get that bunk outlet to work. For a few days, he had been complaining that one of the 12-volt outlets in the bunk section of the cab wasn't working. Apparently, it was a major issue for him even though neither of us had any electronic device other than our cell phones and the bunk had a total of four outlets, only one didn't work. But trying to tell him that fact only made him upset and make him flex his one week of seniority over me. I really didn't feel like arguing, so I left him to it. I go and buy food for dinner, some snacks to have in reserve beverages to hold me over for the night and two packs of cigarettes because smoking was the only thing that could calm my nerves enough to not strangle FK each time he had to wake me up to help him navigate. As I'm heading back, the sun goes down and I can see a nearby pond start to freeze. I quicken my pace so I can get back to the warm cab. As I get to the truck, I see FK in the passenger seat hunched over something. I go around to the driver door and jump in. For those who don't know, trucks meant for long-haul operations have very thick insulation to hold in heat for a very long time. This came in handy since that truck had an idle limiting system that wouldn't allow the engine to run for long periods of time sitting at idle. If the engine was needed to maintain heating or air conditioning while parked, the driver could set a device much like a digital thermostat. You set the control for the temperature you want the cab to be. Select it to either heat or cool and the engine will start and stop to maintain the temperature much like the central unit of a house. Since the cab was well insulated, the cab of the truck could stay warm for hours. Before I left the truck to go to the store, I made sure to set the idle control system to maintain a comfortable temperature. When I got back, however, I couldn't help but notice it was colder than when I had left it, much colder. What was strange about that was that the engine was running fine. Naturally, I checked the temperature controls on the dash, they were set to full heat and full fan. And that's when it hit me, there was nothing coming from the dash vents. The blower fans were dead quiet. I looked over at FK who, I just noticed, is poking around with the fuse panel that was hidden behind the rear panel of the glove box. FK, why is the heat not working? I dunno. It stopped working when I was checking the fuses. That led me to my second question. Why are you messing with the fuse panel? I was trying to get that outlet to work. As you may know, most vehicles have to fuse slash relay panels, one underneath the hood in the engine compartment and another inside. Trucks are the same in that regard except they have a lot more fuses than the average passenger car. One thing that was stressed heavily during my training was that the fuse panel inside the glove box of the truck was strictly off limits. This is because if someone goes about carelessly pulling fuses looking for a bad one without first disconnecting the power, it could cause a surge through the panel and short out other circuits. Since the fuses in the glove box controlled vital circuits such as external lights, dashboard instruments, and engine controls, messing around with them could lead to major issues. Also, the dash blower motor circuit was also fused in that same panel. And FK had been messing with it. It's hard to remember what I was feeling at the time. Anger, hate, panic, homicidal rage, all of the above. Oh, fuck. I exclaimed as jump into the bunk area. I checked the thermostat, it's showing 58 degrees Fahrenheit, 14.4 degrees Celsius when it was set to 73 degrees Fahrenheit, 22 degrees Celsius. I checked the vents in the bunk heat controls and turned them full heat and full fan but sadly, nothing. We were in a truck with no heat and near freezing conditions. To make matters worse, the shop at which we were parked was already closed. We were in trouble. I grab the truck's computer and send an urgent message to dispatch, telling them that our heater isn't working and the temperature outside is dropping fast. FK is still mumbling about the outlet. Will you forget about that goddamn outler? We have no heat. 
Don't you understand that? He said something, but the computer signaled an incoming message. Truck 1234, you have access to your truck, so we can't get you a room. I tell dispatch again that the heater isn't working and it's getting colder by the minute, but they said company policy meant we had to stay in the truck. We were screwed. I turn to FK and say, close that fucking glove box and don't even think about opening it again. At this point, even he realized he screwed up royally. We were stuck in a coal truck for the night. Neither of us has enough money to afford a hotel room and short of starting a bonfire inside the truck, we were in for a cold, cold night. I quickly eat my dinner and stow my food away. I then dig through all the clothes I had with me, looking for every stitch of warm clothing I had and layered up as best I could. I ended up wearing a two long sleeve t-shirts, a pullover hoodie and Carhartt jacket with two pairs of jeans, two pairs of socks, heavy duty work boots and two pairs of jersey work gloves with a fleece blanket for cover. The entire night, I don't think I sleep for two consecutive hours. Despite wearing what felt like a week's worth of clothes all at once, the cold air still permeated through. I stayed curled in the fetal position for the entire night, shivering so hard I could feel the entire truck shake. Each time by violent shivering or chattering teeth brought me out of sleep, I would look at the thermostat control. By midnight, the temperature was well below freezing and, with high winds that had come up, the truck was only getting colder. I can remember feeling disgusted that each time I woke up and not seeing sunlight. At one point, I honestly believed that I wouldn't survive the night due to hypothermia. Finally, at about 6 a.m., I woke up for the last time and decided to go outside. Not because it was any warmer, but because the gas station I went to the evening before opened at that time and all I wanted was a little heat. I didn't wake FK, honestly, I wouldn't have cared if he was dead for the hell his stupid ass just put me through over a power outlet. I walked to the store, looking like a vagrant with withdrawal symptoms from shivering so much. When I walked into the store after that long, bitter night, I wanted to cry because the heat felt so nice. The cashier gave me a puzzled look but saw my baseball cap that had my company's logo and let it go. I bought two cups of piping hot coffee and a warm breakfast. I took my time savoring every bit of it. Since the station had a dining area and wasn't busy, I really wasn't in any hurry to get back. I sat in the station for about two hours before I had to head back. The shop opened at 8 and I wanted to get the truck in the shop and fixed ASAP. I get a third coffee for the walk back and get over to the shop just as the office is opening. FK is waiting outside and sees me holding my coffee. He asked where I got it and I pointed to the gas station. The rep opens the door and we go inside, check in with the desk and hand the truck key to the technician so he can get started. FK, who was useless when it came to things like this, went to the lounge area. I made sure to tell the tech about the fan and asked if he could check it out, he said he would. I signed the paperwork and head to the lounge. In the lounge, FK looks frustrated. He wanted coffee, too, and was disappointed to learn that, since the shop just opened, the office staff hadn't made any in the lounge yet. Well, walk over to the gas station and get one. I say, trying not to snicker. You know I can't walk that far. Why don't you go get me one? He asked indignantly. I should point out that FK had a bad leg due to, if you can believe it, a bad car accident. I know, big shocker. At first, I felt bad for him being partially disabled but by that point, after everything I had endured because of his stupid ass, I was tempted to damage his good leg so they would be a match set. Because I signed the truck in. That means I have to be here when it's released. FK gets mad. Well, why didn't you wake me up and ask me if I wanted anything? He demands, almost throwing a tantrum. It was at this point, my tolerance for FK glitched. This SB had put me through a living hell of no sleep, being thrown around the truck like a rag doll because of his horrible driving, having to take flack for his fuck-ups and getting chewed out for late deliveries because he keeps getting lost. Now, he want me to be his errand boy after nearly causing me to freeze to death? As someone once said, hell to the nana NAW. I set my coffee on a table and raised to my full height, I had at least one foot and one hundred pounds on him. Listen here, you sawed off little bastard, I replied, summoning every last ounce of piss and vinegar in me that wasn't still frozen, because of your dumbass, I barely slept all night. How the hell we're not dead of hypothermia right now, I have no idea. I have put up with your bullshit for over a month and I'm fed up with it. You are not my supervisor, you are not my lead driver and you do not tell me what to do. And if I ever catch you messing around with the fuse panel or anything else on that truck again, I will cut your goddamn throat. And at that moment, I meant it. FK muttered something, but I told him to shut up and he obliged. After a couple of hours, the technician came and told us our truck was ready. FK, still without coffee, sulked off to the truck while I dealt with the paperwork. I asked the tech about the blower fan and find out it was a blown fuse. 
Apparently, FK pulled the fuse and the resulting arc caused the fuse to blow. Since he was an idiot and the fuse panel wasn't labeled, there was no way to know which fuse was blown. He told Mai to make sure that next time I needed to check the fuses to disconnect the batteries first. I laughed, signed the papers, and went back to the truck. Back in the truck, I send a message to dispatch and tell them we're ready to roll. FK had climbed back into the bunk, obviously still sulking. I take the first drive shift of the day so the load can, once again, be back on track. While I wish I could say this was the end of my misadventures with FK, it's not. There's more. Yep, it gets even better, folks. This concludes part 3. Let's move on to part 4 titled, Kevin in a Big Rig Part 4. First Kevin gets lost, Obi gets an idea. Backstory, this story takes place a few weeks after the truck heater snafu. While I would like to say that FK learned from his mistakes and tried to do better, it would be more accurate to say that he merely doubled down on his brain-dead antics. In the interim, his driving skills plateaued at N00B level, his navigation ability was at potato, and his superiority complex had gone from annoying to insufferable. Despite everything, I was still very much a rookie driver, a peon in a very big company and, most importantly, more broke than MC Hammer. I was afraid that doing anything to rock the boat with management would lead to me being fired, in further debt and my truck driving career at an end. To add some perspective to my situation during this, I should mention more about the contract I had in place with the company at the time. In exchange for free training, I had agreed to work for the company for eight months. If I quit or was terminated for any reason before that contract was fulfilled, I would be liable for over $6,000 in tuition fees. Furthermore, since the company owned the training facility at which I trained, they could refuse to release my CDL school records to any prospective employers unless they bought the contract. Since most reputable employers required proof of completion of a CDL school and were unwilling to make such an investment in a relatively inexperienced driver, I was stuck and pretty much at their mercy. This is the dark truth that many supercarriers such as Swift, Werner, and CRSD will not tell you when they promise you a rewarding career and free training. In short, I was pretty much powerless. But that was about to change and, in some strange way, I have FK to thank for that. The morning on which the story takes place started out like pretty much every other day for the past two months. FK finished his shift and me waking up to see what kind of fresh hell of a mess I had to sort out. The day before, we had picked up a load in Pennsylvania with me doing the initial pickup. I had gotten us just across the state line into Ohio before going off duty. Just before picking up said load, I had filled the fuel tanks completely and burned maybe one-fourth of a tank before going off duty. The next fuel stop was in less than 400 miles, we had more than enough fuel to get there. Again, FK had ended his shift with no clue where we were, no surprise there. A quick look out of the window, oh, we're on the shoulder of a highway, what a completely unexpected and unprecedented development, yawn. Fine, let's get this over with. By this point, I had already purchased my own truck-enabled GPS. FK, apparently upset that I didn't recognize his obviously superior ability, had thrown a tantrum and demanded I no longer use his GPS because he would work out the route. Yeah, right? He gets out of the driver's seat and, like the petulant man-child he was, he took his GPS from the mount. A trick I learned from my trainer was, when using a GPS, was to enter the departure and destination and then add each assigned fuel stop in order as waypoints in the route. This forced the GPS to stay on the company route 90% of the time. Also, our fuel payment cards would only work at the assigned fuel stops so it made life easier just to follow it, having to get fuel elsewhere needed a valid reason. Assistance from dispatch and often carried a lecture about the importance of the company assigned route. I had tried to teach this trick to FK, but because he had so much more experience than I did, a full month, he felt he didn't need to listen to me. I set up my GPS and hit the current location function. This of course, as routine as FK never had any clue where we were. I had already familiarized myself with the route and knew which highways, towns, and cities I could use to help get my bearings. This time, however, I was completely stumped. I had expected that FK would have gotten at least as halfway into Illinois, but the GPS had us in some small town in Indiana. Also, it wasn't a town I had seen on either the GPS route or the paper map I routinely used to verify the GPS. Okay, that was odd. I look again at the GPS for a highway number or street name. Again, nothing on it showed me made any sense. I go back to the navigation page where it showed the distance to the next checkpoint, which would have been our next fuel stop. This didn't make sense either as it was showing close to 500 miles to go to the first fuel stop, not the second. 
It had to be a mistake, I think, since we there was no way to be further from the fuel stop than we I went off duty was there. I sit in the driver's seat for about five minutes, trying to make sense of what the GPS is telling me. I had almost convinced myself that the GPS didn't log us reaching the fuel stop and was trying to backtrack. I was about to force it to reroute to the second fuel stop when I, by chance, happened to check the fuel gauge, and my bottom jaw hit the floorboard. Where once the needle had been just above the three-fourth line, it was now showing less than one-fourth of a tank. By my estimates, that was good for about 100 miles safely. Something was very, very wrong. FK, where the hell are we? I ask, knowing it was in vain. I don't know, he replied testily. He had been growing more indignant ever since the heater fiasco. Did you get to the first fuel stop? No. Did you get lost again? He didn't respond right away. I was following the company route, he finally replied proudly. Bullshit. Because we are very low on fuel and further away from the fuel stop than when you started. He looked stunned. Apparently, he hadn't realized that fact. I turn back to my GPS and take a look at the map and everything became clear. When we're way off course, about 300 miles from the interstate we were supposed to be on. I didn't know how, but we were well and truly lost, lost, low on fuel, in the Midwest and well into the wintertime. Fuck my life. I decided to abandon getting back on the assigned route, FK had wasted his entire shift with his unplanned detour and I didn't want to make the situation even worse. I tell the GPS to search for nearby truck stops. It takes a few moments, but the patron saint of truckers had not abandoned me. There was a flying J truck stop less than 20 miles away. I tell the GPS to take me there and send an urgent message to dispatch. I tell them we need our fuel card unlocked for that location and we are dangerously low on fuel. To my surprise, FK did not like this idea. We have to stick to the company route. If we run out of fuel, it's the company's fault. Company route? I scoff, you got us lost, again. You have no idea where we are, again. I have to spend half my day correcting your fuck-ups, again. Right now, the company route doesn't mean a damn thing because I have no clue where we are. What I do know is we need fuel and now. FK starts sulking. Well, if we get in trouble, it's on you. Fine by me. I reply and get us going. My reasoning is that if I run out of fuel at truck stop after requesting the fuel cards open, dispatch would have to explain why they didn't allow it. Running a semi-out fuel requires some very expensive emergency road service. However, if I run out of fuel while going down the highway, it'll have to explain to dispatch, the safety department, and the highway patrol as to why I couldn't read a fuel gauge. I voted to minimize my responsibility and at least get somewhere where is available. The last thing I wanted to do was repeat what happened in that dealership parking lot. About a half hour later, we get to the truck stop. It's early morning so several other trucks are already refueling and we have to wait in line. I checked the computer and, to my surprise, dispatch approved fuel purchase but was concerned as to how we got so far off course. I reply that I just came on duty and FK was the one who got lost, again. I didn't expect anything of this since the night shift dispatchers didn't handle things like employee discipline or service records. When the time comes, I top of the tanks, almost 150 gallons of diesel and try to figure out what I can do to get us back on track. After driving about 5 hours I finally get us back on course and decide to take my legally required break. As I go to put myself off duty, I notice an important message has come from dispatch it's from my fleet manager, he'll call her FM for short, roughly equivalent to a supervisor. Call me ASAP was all it said. Oh great I say. I take my phone, step out of the truck and make the call. What are you two doing? How did you end up so far off your route? Did you follow the route we gave you? What do you mean FM? Well, FK says you have been ignoring the company routes. That's why you've been getting lost. That explains it. FK, the little weasel, sent her a text message with some made-up story. My blood started to boil. FM, first of all, I have no clue what happened. When I finished my shift yesterday afternoon, everything was fine, we were on course and had plenty of fuel. I woke up this morning on the side of a two-lane highway in the middle of bumpfuck, Indiana with no clue how I got there and running on fumes. That's why I sent the message to have the fuel cards opened. Well, you two are a team so you have to work together. I take a deep breath, fighting back the urge launch into a verbal tirade that would surely get me fired. FM, you know what FK is like? Well, just figure it out. She hangs up and I have to fight the urge to throw my phone across the parking lot. A short time later, I return to the truck and make ready to head back out. FK is sitting in the passenger seat, his precious notebook in hand. He's trying to hide a shit-eating grin on his face, but his 1970s porn star mustache gives it away. 
So, he said, you gonna follow the company route? You're a company driver, so you gotta follow the company route. He then hands me his notebook, open to the page he had written down the route. I take it and throw it in the back. Listen to me, shithead. You're not my boss. You're not my trainer. I don't take orders from you. From now on, I'll drive the truck my way, you drive it yours. Unless it's an emergency, keep your cock holster mouth shut. For a moment, he looks terrified, then petulant as he goes back to the bunk. Good riddance. For the rest of the day, I go through everything that had happened over the past two months. When I think that, after all the times I had to babysit a supposedly more experienced partner, I get blamed for everything going wrong, I just get more and more upset. But since I'm a broke, newbie driver under a hobbling contract and no support from anyone, what can I do? I need to get away from this clown, but how? If only there was some way I can prove he's fucking up. I'm just a truck driver. And that's when it hit me, I wasn't always a truck driver. Before I started driving, I was a manager at a steel mill. I was an engineer by trade and my previous job had me dealing with safety and environmental regulations, quality control, OSHA, DOT, and my least favorite, corporate bureaucracy. Corporate Corporation The company I was driving for was a corporation with a hierarchy of increasingly incompetent managers, V.P.S, and directors who will be slow to take responsibility but first to demand someone else do so. However, I happen to know how to get their attention, documentation. But what I needed was something to document. Cue my other valuable skill set, investigation. Part of my old job had been to investigate accidents, chemical spills, defective products, etc. and find out what happened, why it happened, and how to prevent it in the future. In doing this, I learned that the more details you gather, the better. Dates, times, names of witnesses, photos, video, ambient air temperature, tea price in Bangladesh, if it was even remotely relevant, write down. Best of all, I was really good at it, often finding problems everyone else overlooked. So the two pieces of a plan began to form. First off, I would need to observe everything FK did and said, looking for something I could use to prove just how incompetent he truly was. In addition, every time he got lost or went off-route, I would take a picture with my phone of the truck's computer logs showing the GPS pings and their timestamps along with a photo of his daily driver log. FK would be under investigation and not even know it. I finish my drive shift and go off-duty. Before I go to sleep, I decide to check the computer records to see exactly what FK did the night before that got us so very lost. According to the GPS pings, he had, for some reason, turned off the interstate and driven close to 500 miles with over 150 miles going in the opposite than we needed to go. I took snapshots of the ping and FK driver logs, showing that he was on duty when it happened. But that wouldn't be enough, I knew. I need more, much more. So I took an old legal pad and began making a list of everything stupid, dangerous, and dimwitted thing FK had done, included dates and times where I could and started writing an email, an email that would take a month to complete. And that's where I'm going to end part 4. But not to worry, everyone, the story isn't even close to being over yet. This concludes part 4. Let's move on to part 5. Welcome everyone to this installment of the Kevin in a Big Rig series. So, without further ado, let's get into part 5, Shutdown. Backstory, this story takes place only a few days after the events in Part 4. FK and I were heading towards Salt Lake City, but the winter weather that had been slowly ramping up for the past month was only getting worse. We had been fortunate up to this point that the snow and ice hadn't caused any delays, but luck was about to run out. This story begins one night in North Platte, Nebraska on Interstate 80. FK, having driven the day shift, had parked the truck and we changed places. Believe it or not, I sure as hell didn't, FK had actually learned from me and decided to not only stop it in a safe place, but at our designated fuel stop. That meant we could get food, fuel, and do a truck inspection. This was one of the few times FK made a rational decision. While FK went into the truck stop, I refueled and inspected the truck. After making sure the truck was in good shape, I take a look at the weather. A massive winter storm had been building up and all predictions put it and us on a collision course. The company safety department had sent several weather alerts and issued a few restrictions. My personal rule is that shutting down early is more preferable to shutting down too late. I discovered that Wyoming, the next state we were to cross into, was taking a serious pounding from the storm and several accidents were already being reported. Thank God it was my shift this time or FK would have wadded the truck and us into a tight little ball in a ditch. I knew we wouldn't make much progress, but since the roads were still dry and the snow wasn't yet falling, I figured I would be able to make it close to Wyoming before shutting down, let the storm pass and continue on once the roads were clear. 
I had driven this route many times by this point and knew the best places to be stuck. I set the GPS to take us to a truck stop just past the Wyoming state line, go inside for a quick bite and we head out. It wasn't long before the leading edge of the storm had caught us. The further along I drove, the worse the weather deteriorated. Snow flurries melted on the highway, only to be frozen by the rapidly decreasing temperature and larger, heavier snow began sticking to road. In typical fashion for the safety department, their weather alerts were about two hours behind and where they had issued orders to slow down or shut down were for areas well inside the storm, according to them, we could drive the speed limit and they wouldn't say anything. Fortunately, I knew better than to trust the judgment of someone nearly 1,000 miles about the weather I was looking at through the windshield. I had made it about 100 miles when conditions forced my hand. I had already had to reduce speed to barely creeping and the road was invisible beneath the snow. After watching another truck who was driving way too fast lose control and end up in the ditch I make to the call to shut down. I pull into a rather large truck stop not far from the Wyoming state line. By this point, the snow was so deep, the trailer bumper was acting like a snowplow and the tires were having trouble gaining traction. I finally get the truck parked and tell dispatch we're shut down. As I set the truck's idle control system, FK wakes up and asks, are we still in Indiana? In case you're not familiar with US geography, Indiana is a very long way from Wyoming. We hadn't been there for days. We're in Big Spring and we're shut down. We're gonna be here for a while. I tell him, did safety tell us to? I made the call. It's gotten pretty bad. He mumbles that he will get us going once his 10-hour break is up, but I know safety will issue a shutdown, albeit later than it should be. I grab a snack, pull the bunk privacy curtains closed and settle in. I decide to make use of the downtime to work on operation, ditch the dipshit. For the past couple of days, I had been writing down everything I could remember since day one with FK. I jot down everything, major and minor, along with dates, times and locations. Every misturn, unnecessary detour and violation FK had made goes on the list. My plan was to copy it all to email, but I wanted to make sure nothing was left out. While FK was asleep, I decide to go through the truck's computer records. I start by going through FK's hours of service log. This is a legally required record that shows what a driver does every single day. Since drivers can only drive a set number of hours per day, any violation would show on the log. Best of all, these computer logs couldn't be tampered with. Every time he drove longer than he should have, I made a note. The computer also keeps a record of abnormal truck activities. One of these is called hardbreaking event. A hardbreaking event is, as the name suggests, is an instance where the truck experiences excessive braking. Remember how I said FK was heavy on the brakes? Well, the computer agreed. There were dozens, if not hundreds of these records filed during his drive shifts. To be clear, it takes a very hard brake check to trip onto these events. I use my phone to snap a quick photo of the computer screen. I make my notes and climb back into my bunk for the rest of the night. The next morning, I wake up and go to the front of the cab and check the computer for messages. As I predicted, safety had issued a mandatory shutdown for all trucks in out area. Just as well, otherwise I'd have to duct tape FK to his bunk to keep him from trying to leave. The storm was still dumping snow and the paved parking lot of the truck stop is packed full of trucks and the interstate visible from our parking spot is dead quiet. No one was going anywhere. Despite this, I breathe a sigh of relief. FK might be stupid, but his sycophant attitude meant he wouldn't dare defy the company. We were safe for the time being. FK wakes up a little while later. Are we still in Illinois? He asks. No, I reply cautiously, we're in Nebraska. Close to Wyoming. Safety has us shut down. Oh, he replies and goes back to the bunk. It was then that I knew something about FK was off, more so than I thought. Twice in less than 12 hours, he has forgotten where we are. Indiana and Illinois are behind us by a few days at this point, there's no way he could be that confused. I try to put it out of my mind for the time being and decide to brave the weather in the interest of breakfast. I grab some food and coffee and check the weather conditions to the west. Wyoming DOT had shut down the entire interstate and over 200 accidents had been reported in the past 24 hours. I talked to a few drivers who had come in from the west and their accounts matched the reports. It's pretty clear that we're not going anywhere soon. After about an hour, I head back out to the truck and decide to catch up on some sleep. FK is fully awake at this point, messing around with the computer. As I climb inside, he asks, are we still in Illinois? What? He still doesn't know where we are? No, I explain, we're in Nebraska. We got here last night and haven't been in Illinois for three days. You don't remember. 
this was the question that answered far more than I thought. FK explained to me that, about a year before, he had been involved in a serious car accident, one of many. According to him, he ran off the road at a high speed. He was hospitalized with a shattered leg, his bad leg now, and was in a coma for 21 days. His doctors told him that being in a coma that long would likely cause some brain damage, and it had. He had difficulty with his short-term memory and would literally forget something he did five minutes before. This wasn't entirely new to me as he had told this story before. In fact, he had told me countless times over the past two months and it was always the same, bad car accident, 21-day coma and busted leg. Right? I reply. Well, the weather is pretty bad so get comfortable. We're gonna be here a while. I then climb back into my bunk. FK, citing his bad leg, wants to try and find a parking spot closer to the store, but I tell him the lot is completely full and if he moves the truck, we could lose this spot. Reluctantly, he decides to stay put. In my bunk, I go over FK's story. 21-day coma, short-term memory loss, numerous car accidents. If I was asked to pick on person to deny a CDL, it would be FK and not because of the hell I had already been through because of him. Driving a truck is dangerous at the best of times, add a brain-damaged driver and the risk increases exponentially. I knew that this company literally hired anyone who gave them a phone call, but what doctor in his right mind would grant someone someone with brain damage a DOT medical card? I pull out my notes and jot down FK's story as he told it. Later that day, FK wakes up from a nap. I'm in my bunk and he asks, again, are we in Illinois? I sigh, defeated. No, FK, we're in Nebraska. You've asked that three times already. Oh, well, I have bad short-term memory. See, I was in a car wreck and he repeats the same story again, practically word for word. Did safety shut us down? He asked. Yes. So did WYDUT Wyoming DOT? I explain. Oh, okay. He goes quiet again. We end up stuck for two full days waiting for the road conditions to clear. By late morning on the third day, we received word that the road conditions have improved to the point where we can proceed. By that point, FK had repeated his story another three times, each time he was completely unaware he had told it earlier. By this point, I've decided there is something seriously wrong with this guy and he is a danger to himself and anyone sharing a highway with him. I didn't know if I can get him off the road at that point, but I knew I could get reassigned. Our unexpected downtime had given me time to work out my exit strategy. I volunteer to take the first shift, I figure if the roads are iffy, I have the better chance of getting through it safely. This was a good call on my part as I counted no fewer than 20 accident sites in the first 50 miles, many of these still hadn't been cleared and the vehicles were left in the ditch or median. I managed to get a good distance into Wyoming before needing to swap with FK. The weather had broken and everything between us and Salt Lake City was clear. As FK started his shift, everything that occurred during our shutdown replayed in my mind. The more I thought about it, the more it bothered me. FK wasn't just stupid, he was a ticking time bomb. It was time to get as far away from as I could. Before I went to sleep, I take out my notes and cell phone and begin composing an email. I address it to my FM, my fleet manager and CC the safety director. It would take a while to finish as I planned to make sure they knew everything I had seen and experienced over the past two months. Given the nature of corporate politics, I expected to encounter some resistance and being ignored, but that was fine, it would only make the situation worse for them in the long run. And with that, part 5 comes to an end. I know there wasn't much in the way of Kevin-type behavior in this one, but I hope that you at least have a better idea of the kind of person FK was. In the next episode, FK's terrible driving will do actual damage to the truck and my plan to get rid of him will be fleshed out. This concludes part 5. Hello again, and welcome to episode 6 of Kevin in a Big Rig. And with that, let's get on with Kevin in a Big Rig part 6, Breakdown. Backstory, this story takes place about a week after the events of part 5. FK and I made our delivery in Salt Lake City without incident and took another load north to Seattle, Washington. We had picked up another load that was bound for the East Coast when yet another disaster struck. I had made the initial pickup in Renton, Washington and headed east on Interstate 90. Since I had driven half the night before the pickup and into mid-morning, my drive time for the day expired around Tanner, Washington and FK and I switched out. Ahead of us lay barren and mountainous terrain and nearly 3,000 miles of highway across the northern states of the lower 48. Combine that with the ever-threatening winter storms, FK's horrible driving skills and a dwindling supply of tolerance on my part, I was beginning to wonder if FK would kill us both before I could get rid of him. 
At the end of my drive shifts each day, I had been religiously copying the information from the notes I had taken into an email on my phone. I addressed it to my fleet manager and the company safety director. Using my most professional and courteous language, I outlined everything I had witnessed over the past two and a half months. I had reached the point where I didn't want revenge or compensation or even demand he be fired. I just wanted to get away from him. But in order to do that, I needed a valid reason so management would be convinced. One reason? How about a hundred? FK took over and proceeded east along Interstate 90 towards Idaho. As was my habit by this point, I rode shotgun upon first leaving out at first. I'm still in the jump seat when we reach Snoqualmie Pass. In my opinion, there are three critical skills that all drivers must learn if they want to last long enough in the industry to make any real money. Navigation, backing up with a trailer and going down a long, steep mountain grade fully loaded. Going up a mountain might be slow and arduous, going down can quickly turn deadly. If a driver doesn't control the speed during the descent, he will find himself behind the wheel of a runaway death machine. To make the situation more difficult, the brakes of the truck can overheat and completely fail if overused, making the loss of control inevitable. If you've ever driven through mountains and seen runaway truck ramps, that's exactly what they are for, a pre-selected crash scene. Most trucks now have a feature called engine brakes, more commonly known to truck drivers as Jake brakes. Unlike the typical wheel brakes, engine brakes cause the truck to slow down by restricting airflow in engine. This causes the engine to add resistance in the drive train and serve as a sort of drogue chute. Also unlike wheel brakes, engine brakes will not overheat or fail from overuse. When used properly, they can make going down a mountain grade far more efficient and safe. The use of engine brakes also happens to be one of the issues FK and I disagreed upon. While I had been properly instructed by my trainer on how to use the engine brakes effectively, FK was adamantly opposed to them. He wasn't shy about voicing his disapproval of my using them, but there was very little he could do about it. His opinion wasn't due to some rational reason, it was simply because the company safety department said so. During post-training orientation, the course presenters often had made a major issue about how engine brakes weren't that useful and that they wish they didn't come with the trucks. I later learned that these presenters were drivers who mostly quit within two months. I learned from my trainer, a 30-year trucking veteran, that engine brakes were a lifesaver. FK, being the sycophant he was, believed that anything the company higher-up said was the gospel truth. And there we were, myself, FK, a fully loaded truck, and the long, steep decline that was Snoqualmie Pass. Yep, I said to myself, I am definitely regretting my life choices right now. FK starts down the pass. He was in top gear and the truck begins to accelerate rapidly. Since he's not using the engine brakes, the only way he can control the truck's speed without overusing the wheel brakes is to downshift. In order to do that, he must reduce speed. Shifting gears in a semi is a lot different than a regular car since a truck transmission will only go into gear if it and engine are at the proper speed for the gear being selected. FK slams on the brakes, throwing everything in the cab that isn't tied down forward. He tries to downshift, but his timing is off. For a few, heart-stopping seconds, the truck is essentially dropping down the side of a mountain in a freefall before FK manages to wrestle the truck into gear with another whiplash, brake check, and a grinding protest from the transmission. The engine revs up sharply as it fights against gravity and the excess speed for the gear. FK, again, applies extremely heavy braking and grab the handhold above me and push myself back into the seat to cushion the jolt. At this point, I look over at the dash tachometer, it's reading over 1700 RPM, the normal operating range for this truck is between 1000 and 1500 RPM. Slowing down and reducing the engine speed is vital at this point, even FK knew that. He does, applying heavy braking again to slow the engine to just under 1500 RPM and the speed appears to be relatively stable. Then, in move that I can only describe as divine stupidity, FK forces the transmission into the next lower gear. And when I say forced, I mean the truck was actively fighting him as if it were an animal raging in a trap. The gears of the transmission were grinding so hard I thought they would be worn down before we reached the bottom of the hill. Eventually, however, FK's stubborn determination won out and the truck went into gear. The truck screamed in protest. I glance at the tachometer and it's showing close to 2000 RPM, way outside the operating limits. Too much of this and the engine will literally tear itself apart, I knew. What does FK do? Nothing. Goodamnit, I scream at him trying, trying make myself heard over the tortured engine, slow down. Don't tell me how to drive. FK snaps back, apparently he believes this is normal. 
I swear to God, FK, if you wrecked this truck, my sentence was cut off by yet another hard break and I'm wondering if I can stab this little bastard, take over the truck and claim self-defense. We went down that long, steep hill for what felt like hours. The screaming engine begged for mercy and FK was completely oblivious. At any moment I was expecting the engine to explode in a fiery death, taking us to our own a few moments later. But to its credit it held on just long enough. We get to the bottom of the hill and the stress on both the engine and my nerves finally dissipates. At first, I think we dodged yet another bullet. The truck seems to be no worse for the wear and I managed not to kill FK. At that moment, the dashboards lights up more than the annual Christmas tree at Rockefeller Plaza. Every warning light and alarm buzzer is going off as if we were in a movie helicopter that had just been hit by rocket. I swear under my breath and begin looking on my phone for repair shops, truck stops or anywhere nearby where we can get help. And then, as suddenly as it started, the dash goes quiet and the lights turn off. It wasn't a relief, more of the eerie quiet. That's not good. I say, knowing this wasn't some electronic glitch. I go back to my phone, it's the only thing I can do to keep me from snapping FK's neck. By some obscene stroke of luck, there's a dealership service shop at the next exit. It was just then that the dashboard lights and alarms make an encore appearance. I think something's wrong with the truck. FK said as if I hadn't already worked out that much for myself. I give FK my hardest glare. No shit, Sherlock, I reply, you just fell off a fucking mountain and blew the engine up. Oh, what do we do? He asked like a lost little boy. I take this moment to highlight his stupidity. I don't know, super trucker. You're the one who knows everything. Why don't you tell me? To say my nerves were frayed at this point would be a gross understatement. FK keeps looking between the road and the dash. I can tell he's lost, confused, and clueless. Just then, the engine derates, essentially limiting its speed and horsepower in order to prevent further damage. Something is seriously wrong and FK is completely useless. Next exit, I say, there's a dealership shop. FK nods nervously. He rounds a bend and the exit comes in sight. Despite the truck's reduced speed, FK is about to blow right past, something he can't very well afford to do. FK, exit now. I say. Uh, here? He asks, unsure. Now. I scream, not even trying to be civil. FK takes the exit, braking extremely hard again to get slow enough so as not to overturn the truck. I can see the sign for the dealership and guide FK to it. We pull into the parking lot just moments before the truck dies. Charmed life, I think. I turn to FK and say, you send dispatch a message. Tell them where we are and that we're checking into the shop. I'll go talk to the shop. He doesn't get a chance to protest as I jump out and head inside. The techs run a diagnostic and find a long list of fault codes. I have to coordinate between dispatch and the shop because the company maintenance overseer knew nothing about trucks and FK was completely useless and find out that the truck will need to be in the shop overnight. They reluctantly agree to spring for a hotel room within walking distance and we go check in. FK and I spent about three days in that hotel while the truck was being repaired. FK, by virtue of his short-term memory problems, had completely forgotten about how it was all his doing. He gave some speech about how dangerous engine brakes were, but I reminded him that he was the one who was driving when the truck broke down. He tried to pass the blame, but it didn't matter. I had a more important task to focus on. If you ever needed or wanted to know how make a rigid corporate structure to act in your favor, you might want to take notes. I had been gathering evidence against FK for about two weeks before we broke down. In those two weeks, I had been able to gather enough problems against him that would make a district attorney green with envy. I divided my time between copying my notes to email and jotting down new items as the cropped up. It was tedious as the list never seemed to go down, but eventually the email was ready. The only question that remained was who, exactly, would get the email. Normally, I would simply email my fleet manager like one would a supervisor. The problem was such major issue would need nearly every department in the loop. The only problem was the company was strictly compartmentalized and often territorial. It wasn't uncommon to get messages from three or four department heads for one minor infraction. For example, when I had to request fuel in Indiana, I had to explain why to the route planning manager, fleet fuel controller, and the planning department I in addition to my supervisory fleet manager. Not only was this incredibly ineffective and annoying, it did provide insight into how the system could be manipulated. For all its segmented nature, there was one department that had full authority over any other, that was the safety department. Since every trucking company must take safety seriously, the safety managers are taken very seriously. 
More often than not, a safety manager held more power than the CEO and was the one department who could rally the others to a cause. My plan was to send emails to the heads of every department that had jurisdiction over any of FK's violations. Hours of service, planning, human resources, driver training, each department head would get the email. In addition, my fleet manager and the safety manager would get the exact same email. With any luck, one of the emails would trigger an investigation, the findings of which would start a chain reaction. At best, the safety manager would order every department to look into the matter. What I was careful not to do was to come off accusatory or demanding. My philosophy has been to assume ignorance before malevolence, that is, assume that company simply wasn't aware of what was going on. And if I demanded that FK was fired, I would risk coming across as bitter and spiteful, which would accomplish nothing. No, my emails would be professional, concise, detailed, and presented in a way that would say, hey, I found these problems and I wanted to bring them to your attention. The issues themselves would cause the panic. It was during this breakdown that I put the finishing touches on my plan. I dug through the company directory for the relevant emails, organized the documents and photos in the email, and arranged the list of violations by the relevant departments. If and when an investigation took place, all they would have do is look where I pointed. I had nearly completed the email during the three-day downtime while awaiting repairs. The day the truck was repaired, FK and I went to shop a few hours before the truck was released. When the text told us it was ready, I was surprised FK offered to sign it out and take the first shift of the day. It was uncharacteristically generous of him, which I found suspicious but did not say so. I decided to make a restroom stop before we left out. On the way out of the door, I walked by the service desk. The tech who worked on our truck was finishing up the ticket and waved me over. Hey, he said somewhat bewildered, aren't with that short guy with the limp? Yeah, why do you ask? I reply. Well, he asked a weird question. I take a deep breath. I had a feeling what that question would be. Let me guess, he was asking about the engine brakes. The tech was taken aback. Yeah, he wanted to know how to disable them. I thought it was weird because why would anybody want to do that? I shake my head in disgust and glance to make sure FK isn't in the room. Did you tell him? Hell no, the tech admitted. You'd be an idiot not to have them. I nod in agreement. By the way, I ask, what was it that was wrong with the truck? There was some cracks in the turbocharger housing, he explained. Aha. Uh -huh. And would keeping the engine at 2000 RPM all the way down Snoqualmie cause that? He looked at me knowingly. You better tell somebody about him if he can't drive any better than that. Oh, don't worry, I assure him. I will. And that ends part six, breakdown. Once again, a big thank you to everyone who is listening and made it this far. And again, this concludes part six. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Kevin in a Rig. As always, thanks for listening and consider dropping a subscribe. And so, what so many of you have been waiting for, let's get into Kevin in a Big Rig part seven, flashpoint. Backstory. These events take place over the span of a couple of days immediately following the events in Part 6, Breakdown. The three-day breakdown had forced dispatch to call in another truck to rescue the load. I had figured as much since the load was considered high priority and, with an even more serious winter storm than what we faced in Nebraska bearing down on us, dispatch wanted to get the load to its destination as soon as possible. That left myself, FK, a repaired truck, an empty trailer, and precious little time before we become stranded again by old man winter. Almost as soon as we get the truck out of the shop from FK's fiasco on Snoqualmie, dispatch sends us a load. It was to pick up in Lewiston, Idaho that same evening and deliver in Chicago. I was relieved as this put us heading away from the storm and, with luck, would keep us ahead of it. When I plotted the route, however, I was abruptly reminded that while the patron saint of truckers might protect those who call upon him, he also has a very morbid sense of humor. Lewiston is a mountain town along the Washington-Idaho border. From where we began, it would take the better part of a day traveling through remote areas with little chance of assistance if something were to happen. And because I hadn't suffered enough, the only way into Lewiston was south along US-95 and down another steep mountain grade. That was worse than Snoqualmie. How bad? Well, if Snoqualmie was a black diamond ski slope, Lewiston would be a triple black diamond, skull and crossbones level and require a signed waiver of liability and clearance from a psychiatrist. And just for kicks, FK would be driving us there. Upon realizing this, I texted my mom, told her I loved her and that I was probably going to be dead in the next few hours. She thought I was drunk. For the first few hours, I stayed in the bunk trying to get what little sleep I could. 
FK's horrendous driving did not help matters as I was constantly being woken up by my head being slammed into a cabinet by his excessive braking. I finally had to use my jacket as a makeshift cushion and keep my head from suffering a concussion. The truck drove on and on and on. Sleep, when it came, was fitful and fleeting. The jarring of the brakes and the whine of the over-revving engine foretold of an impending fate so terrifying as to make Edgar Allan Poe wet the bed and Stephen King by a nightlight. As the sky grew dark and the cold air began to bite, I decided I had slept as much as I could, pulled on my boots, and went up front. I looked out of the windshield and saw what I had been dreading, the warning sign for the steep drop into Lewiston. The highway on which we made the descent was also the town's main thoroughfare, fall off the cliff, roll into town. Any loss of control here and a lot of people besides us would more than likely be killed. I just hoped that, if I did die that night, it was quick, painless, and FK would join me so I could beat his ass for all eternity. FK started down the grade, picking up speed too fast at first, but thanks to being empty, speed control was much easier. Still adamantly opposed to engine brakes, he maintained his speed through downshifting and heavy braking, much like he had attempted to do on Snoqualmie. When he finally managed to stabilize his speed, I lit a cigarette because I think all people doomed to die deserve one last smoke. But it wasn't my last smoke or my last day on earth. Despite everything, FK managed to get the truck down the mountain and into the town without it ending in a fiery crash. I let out a breath I didn't realize I was holding and take a long drag of my cigarette to calm my nerves. We were safe for the time being. FK manages to get us to the pickup after getting lost, of course, and we change out while we are being loaded. I sit down in the driver's seat and program the route into my GPS. Getting back to the interstate was going to be tougher, I saw, as it was more remote wilderness, mountainous terrain and little chance of help in an emergency. Adding to the difficulty was the fact that the storm we were desperately trying to outrun was catching up to us. Fortunately, it wasn't long before we get fully loaded and head to a local truck stop to top off the tanks since it was nearly 150 miles to the nearest truck stop. I refuel the truck while FK goes inside the store. After a several minutes, both fuel tanks filled and FK still inside doing God knows what, I pull the truck out of the fuel pumps and pull around to the parking area. I dash inside, grab some food, drinks and smokes and come back to the truck to find FK still isn't back yet. I begin to fantasize about what's keeping him. Stroke? Brain aneurysm? Abducted by aliens? They do tend to take the dumbest people after all. But, alas, the hope was fleeting as I soon see him hobbling his way across the parking lot towards the truck, carrying a plastic bag and looking like Hobo about to ask for a dollar. FK opens the passenger door and climbs inside. Hey, mother F asterisk 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 er, he yelled angrily, why'd you move the truck? I point at the all trucks proceed to parking when fueling complete signs hanging near the diesel pumps. Because I can read, dickhead, I reply. You know I have a bad leg. It hurts to walk that far. Do that again and I'll kick your ass, he threatens weakly. If you recall in part 2, I mentioned I was at least 1 foot taller and 100 pounds heavier than FK, so his threat was more comical than menacing. Oh really? I reply, you wouldn't lift a foot above my knees before I ripped that gimp leg off and beat you to death with it. Sit the fuck down and shut up. He mumbled something, but I didn't hear him as I released the brakes and pull out of the parking lot. The climb up the mountain was slow and painstaking. Snow was just starting to fall, but not yet heavy enough to be a serious concern. FK riding shotgun was grumbling about his leg, the cold and whatever else he felt like complaining about. I get to the top of the hill and press on, trying like hell to stay in front of the storm. FK remained up front, though he had moved past griping and on to bragging about his future plans. Apparently, he had high aspirations for his trucking career. In a few months, he was going to become a lead driver, the title the company gave to driver trainers and work his students like racial slur, his words, not mine. He also planned on becoming an independent contractor by leasing a truck through the company and making a lot more money. This would also allow him to run a little side business with his nephew who, according to FK, was some major player in prison chapter of the Aryan Brotherhood. He claimed his nephew could set him up running contraband out of Mexico. I paid very little attention to him as I'm more concerned about the winter storm that is almost on top of us. We start going down a hill, nothing serious but enough that I take my foot off the accelerator, I never trust cruise control in a semi. This causes the engine brakes to engage and, on cue, FK takes it personally. If you were my student, he said, trying sound pretentious, I'd fail you for that. What the fuck ever, man? At least I can go five minutes without getting lost. I reply, not missing a beat. Don't use those things on my truck. He demands. 
I'm not, dumbass. I shoot back. This is the company truck, remember? Just then, we start down another hill, this one a bit longer but not overly steep. Again, I release the accelerator and the engine brakes re-engage. This was, apparently, the last straw for FK. He reaches down, unbuckles his seat belt and reaches over towards the steering wheel. The activation button for the engine brakes is on the right side of the steering wheel. I see his hand and slap it away. Cut it out, dickhead. I tell him. He tries again, this time getting out of the seat and towering over me while reaching for the engine brake button. This is extremely dangerous as it's dark, we're on a narrow road and visibility is reduced because of the snow. I don't have the luxury of handling this diplomatically, so I grab him by the shirt with my right hand and literally throw him back into the passenger seat hard enough that his head bounces off the window. If you ever pull a stunt like that again, I tell him I will break every bone in your body and leave you to the buzzards. You're not a lead driver and this is not your truck. Sit down, buckle up and shut up. FK obviously hadn't expected that reaction, apparently he was living in a fantasy universe where he was the trainer and I was the student. I suppose that knock to the head was enough to bring him back to reality or as close as he could get since he buckled his seatbelt and went about copying the company route to his precious notebook. A couple of hours pass in silence. The snow begins to fall heavier and accumulate on the ground and stick to the road. The wind had begun to pick up and was rocking the truck side to side. It felt like an eternity since we had seen the last town, car, or even abandoned building. I had just started to begin thinking that maybe we hadn't survived the downgrade into Lewiston and this was my own personal hell when, far in the distance, I see the lights of a town. I check the GPS and, sure enough, it's exactly where we are to rejoin Interstate 90. I was less excited about being on the interstate as I was about the prospect of finding shelter from the approaching storm. As we make our way through town, I keep my eyes peeled for a truck stop, Walmart, gas station, anything that might offer a safe harbor for the night. But, to my increasing dismay, nothing. To make matters worse, the town appeared to be deserted. Even the 24-hour convenience stores were dark and empty. Suddenly, a few miles before reaching the interchange, a message comes across the computer. FK takes the computer and reads it. It's a weather alert. He says, it says we have to shut down. Of course, I say, still looking for somewhere to park and finding nothing. Keep an eye out for a truck parking spot. We get closer to the interstate and find nothing. Even the gas stations with truck diesel lanes are clearly posted, no truck parking. My only alternative is to get back on the interstate and keep going until I find somewhere to shut down. I'll admit, this is the last thing I wanted to do, but my hands were tied. FK, however, simply could not understand the situation. Why are you getting on the interstate? He asked, safety told us to shut down. Yeah, but there's nowhere T.O. shut down. I reply. You have to stop, he insists. Safety will write you up. Where? On the side of City Highway? You really think that's a good idea, jackass? Looking back, I now see how ironic this question was. FK gave up, apparently being thrown bodily against a window one-handed takes away your nerve. Well, if safety says anything, it's on you, he says. I'm fine with that. And I'll tell them the same thing I'm telling you, you can't just stop in the middle of the fucking road. I take the on-ramp to Interstate 90 eastbound. I keep my speed at around 45 miles per hour, 72 kph, since, knowing we shouldn't out here according to safety, I can at least use the fact that I was driving at a greatly reduced speed to say, yeah, I know, I should be shut down. But there's nowhere to shut down so I have to keep going until I find a place to shut down. I plod along Interstate 90 through the Idaho Panhandle and find nowhere to park. The truck computer is going crazy, dinging every few minutes with messages wanting to know why we are traveling through a shutdown area. I can't send any reply since I'm driving and FK is content to let me deal with it. I drive well into Montana before I see Salvation, a truck safety rest area. It's little more than a super wide shoulder on the side of the highway, but it's reasonably safe, legal for us to use, and more importantly, it has enough room for us to get into. I guide the truck into a parking spot, shut off the headlights, and pick up the computer. I put myself off duty and go about responding to the messages. All but one are automated messages about the shutdown notice and the fact we are operating in one. The one non-automated message is from the night dispatcher. You are operating inside of a shutdown area. Please shut down as soon as possible. The message asked. What the hell did you think I was planning, dickhead? I say to the screen. I reply, could not find safe and legal parking spot when alert received. Was forced to continue on until a safe and legal parking area could be found. We are now shut down. 
intentionally used the words safe and legal in my reply because, according to the company's own driver handbook, a truck that receives a weather shutdown notice must find a safe and legal place to shut down until the notice is lifted. That was their own policy verbatim, I was just following it, safe and legal. I decided to go back to the bunk and sleep, it was pretty obvious we were going nowhere until morning at least. The next morning, I'm awakened by the sound of the truck brakes releasing. I jump out of my bunk and check the computer. Safety had released the shutdown and implemented a 45 miles per hour limit for the area. FK took it upon himself to take the first shift so I crawled back into the bunk. A couple of hours later, I'm woken up by my phone ringing. I check it unknown number but the area code matches the company headquarters so I answer. Hello? I answer. Hi, is this OP? Driver ID 9876 replied the voice. Uh yeah. This is Ken, not real name, from safety. This call is being recorded. We had a report that you willfully violated a mandatory shutdown area last night. Son of a bitch. FK tried to turn me into safety. After the stunt he pulled with the engine brakes. Well, Ken, I reply, I suppose that depends on your definition of violated dot. Did you continue to drive after receiving a notice of the shutdown? Yes, I answer truthfully. Can you explain why? Well, Ken, if you refer to company driver handbook, such and such page, such and such paragraph, you will see that it clearly states that, and I quote, upon receiving a shutdown alert, the driver must park the truck as soon as it is safe and legal to do so. End quote. Now, as I told the night dispatcher, I was not in an area that provided safe and legal parking and, therefore, was forced to continue on until safe and legal parking could be found. However, I was well aware of the dangerous road add weather conditions and elected to proceed at a speed no faster than 45 miles per hour, 72 kph, and shut down at the nearest safe and legal place available. For a few moments, Ken was quiet, but I heard the telltale tapping of a computer keyboard through the phone. I see. Well, looking at your route, I see that there was very little in the way of parking or facilities. No shit, Sherlock, I think to myself. That was my assessment of the situation as well, I confirm. Well, he continued, we received this report from an anonymous phone call and we had to follow it up. Anonymous, my ass? Am I being written up for this? Not at this time since, as you say, you were trying to get to a safe, legal parking area. We may look into this matter further at a later time. However, I would like stress that you take care in the future. I manage to hide my rage when I respond, always do. Thanks, and hang up. For a few moments, I started at the bunk ceiling in furious disbelief. Anonymous phone call? Yeah, that was bullshit since there was only one person who knew I had driven at that time who would have made a phone call. FK, the rat fink bastard, had tried to grasp me up on the sly. Only he made one critical mistake, he underestimated me. I knew the safety policy apparently better than the safety department themselves and I had probably saved my job and career by doing so. No doubt the little shit thought he won by his little ass kissing exhibition and he would no doubt try again when he realized it didn't work. But he wouldn't get that chance, oh no. Run game on me, little man, and I'll show you how it's played. I open my phone's email app and go to the saved email draft I had been preparing for so long. I attach the photos of the computer logs, double check for missing issues, add in about the incident where he tried to grab the steering wheel while I was driving and plug in the email addresses of the relevant department heads. I also make one addition to the end of the email, letting them know that, seeing as how the issue was habitual and ongoing, I would continue to provide daily updates via email on FK's infractions and unsafe actions. Why email, you wonder? Well, in the eyes of the law, an email is considered an official document. By using email, I could use it as proof that I communicated the issue to the company. If the situation progressed to the point where legal action became necessary, the emails could be used as evidence that the company was made aware of the issue but did nothing, that is negligence. I knew it and they should know it too, I thought. Well, they claim to put safety first, so let's see. I give the email a final once over. It's ready, I think. I move my thumb up to the send icon and freeze. For a moment, a tiny voice of doubt pipes up. Is this the right thing to do? You could put yourself in the firing line with this. Even if you pull it off, it could ruin FK's life. Is what he did so bad to really be worth that? For a moment, I almost consider not going through with it. Just ask for a new co-driver in. That thought was interrupted by my forehead banging off the cabinet, again. FK and his piss per driving. Never mind, I tell myself decisively, fuck this asshole, and hit send. There was the slightest bit of regret when I saw the status of the email change from sending to sent. 
Oh well, too late now. No turning back. The missiles were in the air. Nothing left to do but wait. And that concludes part 7, Flashpoint. As always, I want to thank each and every one of you for all your kind support and encouragement over the past couple of weeks. It means more to me than you will ever know. And once again, this concludes part 7 of Kevin. Hello once again everyone and thank you. Let's dive into episode 8 titled, Kevin in a Big Rig Part 8, Break Check. And for those of you who have a love-slash-hate relationship with the cliffhangers, I refer you to a quote by the late Bobby Womack. Leave them wanting more, and they'll always call you back. It worked for him and it worked for Scheherazade. And now, you can call off the angry mobs and reseal the pit of eternal Kevins. I present to you Kevin in a Big Rig Part 8, Break Check. Backstory. This story takes place immediately after the events in Part 7, Flashpoint. After making me dodge a bullet from safety after FK's petty little phone call, he decided to continue along Interstate 90 eastbound through Montana. The winter storm that had forced us to shut down had slowed and moved south during the night, leaving us running along the its northern edge. We hadn't seen the last of it. After sending the email that I hoped would seal FK's fate, I tried to get some sleep. It wasn't easy, going over the possible scenarios and contingencies to which launching such an unexpected attack would lead. I didn't expect a quick resolution or that I would be taken seriously at first. That was fine, if I, a lowly truck driver, wasn't enough to get a trucking company to stick to their safety first policy, then I had some bigger guns play with. I need only to bide my time, give them a fair chance, but give no quarter should they try to hide from their responsibility. If management had any sense, they would play ball and get this moron off the highway. I woke up again around mid-afternoon. FK was still driving but, knowing he would be out of time soon, I decide to get up and see what new mess FK had gotten us into. I pull on my boots and, expecting nothing, I check my phone. To my mild surprise, there's an unread email from my fleet manager. Okay, it read, we'll forward this to safety. Thanks. Aha, I say to myself. Passing the buck and covering your ass. Smart move. At least one person did the right thing. Let's see if the rest follow suit. I close the email and head up front. To my relief, FK was on course and with enough fuel to get to the next fuel stop. I say nothing to him, he says nothing to me. Awkward? I was born awkward, bring it on, Skippy. I take the truck computer, scrolling through the messages to see if anyone from the company had sent anything related to email bombs I had dropped on half the company. Again, nothing. They were either ignoring me outright, which would be very bad for them in the long run, or I had unleashed a demon from the safety department who demanded a blood price for everyone letting FK go that long. In any case, there wasn't much I could do until safety made their move or decided not to move. I set the computer down, lit a cigarette, and took out my phone again. I forwarded the nuclear email to my then-girlfriend, telling her that if anything happened me, she was to get this to a lawyer, press charges for negligence, gross misconduct, whatever, and sue this company into bankruptcy. I also BCC her to all future emails so she would have them as well. Dramatic? Maybe, but I wasn't going to let this get swept under the rug. Next, I checked the weather and see the storm had moved to the south. Although the weather was clearing, the temperature hovered barely above freezing during the day and dropping quickly at night. With the ice and snow from previous storms, this presented a dangerous situation. Ice would thaw during the day, allowing safe travel but would refreeze into black ice after sunset, making driving unsafe. Icy roads meant more slowdowns and shutdowns from safety, making this trip even more torturous, nerve-wracking and tempting to smother FK in his sleep, bury him in a shallow grave and claim he simply wandered off. Tempting, but after the email I had sent, it would look a little too suspicious. I watch Law and Order. FK drove for about another hour before the computer alarm signals that his drive time is running low. Lucky for him, our next fuel stop is only a few miles away. We get to the truck stop and FK, claiming his poor leg is hurting him, leave me to handle the refueling while he goes inside. I top of the tanks, give the truck a quick once-over and go inside myself for supplies to get me through a hard night of driving. As it turned out, that hard night only lasted about three hours as the frozen roads forced another shutdown, just as I predicted. This went on for about two more days, slow going due to safety mandated slowdowns during the day and shutdowns coming at night when the roads froze over again. I barely said a word to him, but FK, thinking that he had subjugated me with his little, anonymous phone call, regaled me with his tired, old stories. Car wrecks, jailbird nephew, 21 day coma, how he was going to cut the engine brakes out of the truck, I began to sympathize with Bill Murray's character in Groundhog Day, every day was simply a repeat of the last. Adding to the frustration was the lack response to my email to safety. 
I was getting the feeling that they were actively ignoring me, but I stayed true to my word, sending them daily updates on FK's actions. Most of the updates were simply repeats of previous issues, but one would think that if a peon was willing to take the time to their job, they would at least send a thank you. By the end of the second day, I start planning to go even higher, wondering how I would go about sending a certified mail to the company CEO. Around early afternoon of the third day, we made it down the eastern slope of the Rockies through Bozeman, Montana. The roads were clear and dry and nothing from safety telling us to stop. I was driving at the time and couldn't help but feel relieved. Montana is a beautiful state, but in that instance, it was Hades. In my mind, I imagined William Shatner saying, warp speed, Mr. Sulu, and gun the accelerator down the interstate, headed for Wyoming. I managed to get us as far as the port of entry in Sheridan, Wyoming before running out of drive time late that evening. I go inside, check in with the Wyoming DOT and get a weather update, WYDUT POE staff are awesome people. They tell me that the roads are clear between there and South Dakota. First good news in a while. I show them the paperwork they ask for, stop by restroom and head back to the truck. In the dark parking area, I see the hood of the cab rolled open and FK shining a flashlight underneath. Odd, but I think he's just checking the oil or looking for fluid leaks. It's a bit of a walk to the truck from the office. The POE has a large parking lot and most of the closer spaces are taken up by other trucks staying for the night. I expected FK to be done in a few seconds, but by the time I get to the truck, he's still underneath the cab. I can see a pair of pliers in his hand and suddenly become concerned. There was nothing wrong with the truck and no reason he needed any kind of tool, not that he should be trusted with one in any case. What the hell are you doing? I ask. FK, not having heard me approach, nearly jumped out of his skin. Oh, I was looking at something. What? I ask in my not messing around tone. I saw online how you can disable the Jake brakes. I was gonna try it. He replied. I wasn't mad, I was just absolutely fed up with this. Get in the goddamn truck, you dumbass. And if you try that shit again, I'll make sure safety and maintenance get the video. He starts sulking, but closes the hood. I climb inside, send another email update including how he just tried to disable an integrated safety system on the truck, this is a major no-no, equal cutting the brake lines on a car. For a split second, I was tempted to let him hang himself with that stunt, but decided not to because, given his track record, the truck would likely explode with me in it. FK finally pulls out of the POE and gets us going again. I settle in the bunk because I really didn't want to talk to him anymore. It takes a while to get to sleep, partly due to FK's poor driving and partly because my brain is busy planning out strategies for my inevitable battle with FK and safety. FK drove through the night, managing to get through Wyoming and South Dakota just shy of the Minnesota border. I wake up late the next morning and check my email, nothing. Keep digging yourselves in a deeper hole, I think while getting ready. I was beginning to think they weren't taking me seriously. Then, when he hears me stirring behind him, FK yells back, Dispatch wants us to head back to main terminal when we deliver. Oh, I say, legitimately surprised, did they say why? No, FK replied before impatiently getting out of the truck. And so it begins, I think to myself. After Chicago, two of us will drive back to the terminal, but only one of us will leave. I was determined that, no matter what, I would not continue with this fool after this battle with management was over. I had been tossed around, frozen, chewed out by customers and management, deprived of sleep and driven to the point of insanity over the past three months and I was not going to put up with it any longer. If they tried to pull that, you two need to get along crap, I would forward everything I had on them to OSHA, DOT, and any government agency I could think of. It would take no time at all to find enough dirt to bury the entire company and send half the managers to jail for negligence. I would convince my friends and family to buy stock in competitors first, of course. Fire me and I wouldn't stop until I owned every truck in the fleet to soothe my mental and emotional distress. As for FK, they would have to dig up half the shoulders on Interstate 80 to find his shallow grave, that is, if I felt gracious enough to dig one instead of making him dinner for a pack of coyotes. I had nothing to lose at this point and I was ready for a fight. I settle into the driver's seat and set up my GPS. It was then that I noticed something, odd. On the steering wheel there are two sets of controls, the left side had the cruise control and the right was the activation button for the engine brakes. These buttons were the recessed type with a protective rubber blister and backlit with an LED so it can be seen in low light. The engine brake switch was damaged, not worn or dirty but cut away. I look closely and I can clearly see what I had been afraid of, the telltale cuts from a knife blade. 
It wasn't some accidental snag or wearing away from use. There were clear, distinct lines marking where the rubber blister had been cut away. The button itself was, fortunately, still intact and functioned. I pressed it and the indicator light came on. It was immediately clear that FK wasn't able to remove the engine brakes. They were integrated into the engine and tried to make it so I couldn't turn them on. Too bad for him that the truck's designers decided that the engine brakes were important enough to warrant protecting the on switch. All FK managed to do was give me one more nail for his coffin. Clear proof he had tried to tamper with the truck. I snapped a photo and emailed it to them, explaining this was not like this when I went off duty and made sure the knife marks were unmistakable. FK comes back on the truck after a bit. I don't mention the switch at all, but without being prompted, FK demanded, don't use those Jake brakes. I say nothing at first, but when we leave out, I make sure they engage on the way out of the parking lot and dare him to say anything more about it. I drive all through Minnesota without stopping. Each time I have to reduce speed, I make sure to use the engine brakes. They weren't as loud as older models, but it did make a distinctive sound when the truck was coasting. I knew it was pissing him off and there was nothing he could do about it. Any more damage to the steering wheel and or suspicious damage under the hood he would have to explain why he damaged a perfectly good truck to disable a safety device. Little did either of us know that the next message that came from the computer would change everything. It was from the fleet manager, OP Urgent. Call me ASAP. Uh oh, I say, sounds like all hell just broke loose. The company did not allow cell phone use while driving, even hands-free was prohibited and I wasn't giving FK anything to use against me. I decide to wait until the next fuel stop to make the call. I get to the truck stop, refuel, and go inside the store to place the call while taking the legally mandated 30-minute break. Hey, FM, this is OP, driver ID 9876, I say. Oh, yeah, she replied, seeming very hesitant. OP, what the hell is going on? There's no point in playing dumb at this point. You can't launch the professional email equivalent of a nuclear warhead and play innocent. You got my emails. Yeah, I did, she replied, and so did every department head in the company. Safety has been going apes hit over this. I really didn't want to, I say, only a half-truth, but FK is getting more and more dangerous and I can't stay in this truck with him anymore. Actually, it's FK I need to talk to you about. Okay. What's up? Well, in your email, you said he had memory problems and he said he had been in a coma for 21 days. Yeah. Are you sure he said 21 days? It was 21 days, I reply, leaving no room for doubt in my tone. He has told that same story every day for three months and it's always the same, 21 days. Yeah, I thought so. He told me the same thing, she claimed. What the fuck? She knew about this. Are you kidding me? I wanted to blow up right there, but I managed to keep my cool. What's going on? I asked calmly. I'm not sure, she replied. Safety wanted me to ask you because it struck them as odd. It was 21 days, I repeat, just to drive home the point. Right? All right, safety wants you guys back here right now. We'll get someone else to run the load. You just get here so we can get this mess straightened out. I was tempted to probe for more information, but I had the feeling there was nothing left to say. All right, I have enough hours and fuel, so we should get there tonight. Good deal, she replied, we'll talk tomorrow morning and hangs up. It takes a few seconds to process what just took place. I had expected that the emails would cause a bit of a stir, but to have a truck divert nearly 200 miles to relay a load was unheard of. Well, I got their attention at least. I head back out to the truck. FK was still sleeping and I had no intention of waking him up to tell him of our new orders. I program the new route into the GPS and verify it with the Atlas. The company's headquarters was only 200 miles or so away, but getting there would take us well away from the interstates and any other major highway. It was shaping up to be a long trip along mostly narrow, two-lane highways south through Wisconsin, Nebraska, and Iowa, Idaho all over again. I then checked the weather and realized then that I had royally pissed off someone in past life. Remember that winter storm we hit in Idaho and Montana? It was back. Only now it had eaten its Wheaties and bulked up into a full-blown blizzard. Almost the entire route from the truck stop all the way to the company's main terminal was in its sights and it had itchy trigger fingers. The National Weather Service had issued alerts for the entire area with predictions of heavy snow, high winds, and whiteout conditions. Sounds like fun, right? Under normal situations, I would have to take in one look at the weather radar, said, fuck that noise, and told dispatch I wasn't even about to attempt that run. They could simmer for a couple of days. Unfortunately, as was the case with FK, nothing was ever normal. I had to factor his stupidity into every decision I made and this one was had a very big issue. 
The issue boiled down to the company's weather shutdown system. For whatever reason, the shutdowns only pertained to certain highways, primarily interstates and major U.S. highways between designated towns, mile markers, boundaries, etc. It did not, however, pertain to geographic areas like cities, counties, or states. Instead of all trucks operating in this part of that state, you need to shut down. They were more like any truck on such and such highway in such and such state between mile markers X and Y shut down now. The problem with this company's system, it didn't issue shutdowns for secondary routes like two-lane highways. In bad weather, the decision to shut down was a judgment call on the part of the driver and the decision was never questioned or punished. Federal regulations made it very clear that the driver made the final decision as to when and if the trip would continue. I understood that, but FK on the other hand. And as for FK's precious company route, there wasn't one. The company assigned routes were only generated for trucks under a load assignment. Being diverted like this meant we had to figure it out ourselves. I had no problem with it, but FK. He'd probably take a wrong turn into a ghost town where we would become the inspiration for a new horror movie franchise. Give me a break, I plead to any higher power that may have been listening. I had just gotten the word that the hornet's nest I threw into the the company's garden party was starting to sting some important asses and now, I'm going to get taken out by the ghost of Frosty the Snowman. I would have gladly waited it out but FK, being the little sycophant ass kisser he was, would think that, if safety didn't tell him to shut down, he didn't need to shut down. Blinding snow, icy roads, no visibility, it didn't matter to him. He was a company driver and the company told him what to do. Slow down? Shut down? Only if the company told him to. FK hadn't killed us this far, not for lack of trying, but this was just too much. I made up my mind at that point, no matter what, FK would not sit in that driver's seat at all that night. He wouldn't drive the first inch during that storm even if I had to kill him. If he took over, he would surely head down the highway at full speed, run headfirst into a total whiteout, slam on the brakes, and send us both on a one-way trip to the afterlife. This little bastard had been dragging me through hell for so long and he was not going to get another chance to kill me. I took a deep, ragged, and exasperated breath. I had two choices in front of me, literally kill FK or tackle the blizzard ravaged backroads myself. Rock, meet hard place. It's been nearly seven years since that day, looking at that phone screen with the route plunging into the storm's radar image. Even now, I often wonder if I made the right decision. I don't know how long I agonized over it, but when the decision was made, it wasn't with absolute certainty. But one thing was clear, there was only one way both of us would make it out of the sub-zero hell alive. Fuck you, FK, I say to myself as I fasten my seatbelt, release the brakes, and roll out to meet the blizzard head-on. Fuck. You. After everything you've put me through, I'm still trying to save your worthless life. And this is where part 8 ends. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Kevin in a Big Rig. The finale episode. And so, to put an end to the suffering, let's get into Kevin in a Big Rig part 9, Nuclear Winter. Backstory. This installment begins immediately after the events in part 8. It wasn't long after leaving that truck stop in Wisconsin that I began regretting my decision to push on. It seemed as if the storm had been watching us since we left Lewiston and decided to lay a trap for us once we crossed back into Minnesota on that remote two-lane highway. Every moment that passed brought heavier snowfall, falling temperatures and winds that threatened to push the truck into the ditch and leave us stranded. Even as the sun went down and the sky turned to pitch black, there was no sign that the storm was inclined to show mercy. On the contrary, it seemed dead set on punishing me for the hell I had unleashed upon the company a few days before. Karma can be a bitch like that. I've learned that, during times of life-threatening conditions beyond the control of mortal humans, people have one of two reactions. Many, unable to cope with having their fate in hands other than their own, become overwhelmed with anxiety and give in to irrational panic. Those who are unwilling to simply resign themselves to whatever fate may have in store will stop at nothing until they find a way to cheat fate long enough to make an escape. That night, I knew that giving in to fear would mean more than likely end in our deaths. At the very least, we would be stranded in the middle of nowhere until someone dug us out of several feet of snow. Maintaining control of both myself and the truck was non-negotiable if I wanted to see the next morning. Since fear and panic would serve not purpose, I disengaged the emotional parts of my mind and relied purely on instinct, skill, and training. As the night wore on and the conditions steadily worsened, I could feel my control of the situation waning with each mile that passed by. The increasingly heavy snowfall limited visibility to a couple of dozen meters and the wind hammered against the trailer as if it were the sail of a tall ship. 
The narrow roads offered very little margin for error and the strong wind gusts required precise corrections in order to keep all 18 wheels on the asphalt. The headlights, to their credit, did their best to light the way forward, but with the combined onslaught of dense snow both falling from the sky and being blown in front of the truck, they hampered visibility almost as often as they assisted. As visibility oscillated between meters to inches and back within the span of seconds, I had to rely on instinct and timing to keep the truck between the ditches. At times, the snow was so thick that even the beams from the headlights disappeared completely underneath a blanket of white powder. To say that I wasn't tempted to abandon the trip and take my chances with keeping FK out of the seat would be a complete lie. I don't know how many suitable parking places I passed at night, many I very nearly took advantage of only to change my mind at the last second and push deeper into the storm. When I passed a small mom and pop truck stop that, in spite of the frozen tempest, was still open and offering food, shelter, and safe harbor, I was convinced that I had gone completely insane. Who in their right mind would forego sanctuary when the odds were so heavily stacked against him? That would be me, apparently. Each time the temptation of seeking shelter crossed my mind, I was immediately reminded that we were well off the beaten path as far as safety was concerned. FK, completely oblivious as to what was waiting for us, wouldn't think twice before diving headfirst into the storm until he received an order to shut down that I knew would never come. His needlessly heavy braking, teeth-rattling gear changes and inability to drive five minutes without taking his eyes off the road to check his notebook would slash our chances of making it through the night from remote to non-existent. The only way to keep FK out of the driver's seat, short of killing him, was to make sure my backside didn't leave it. For me the entire night was an unending exercise in keeping my growing fear in check. Before that night, the most terrifying situation I could remember being in was the time I was doing my solo cross-country flight as part of the training for my pilot's license. That day, I found myself alone in a small airplane dodging an intense line of thunderstorms while being almost completely lost. I mention it here because, during that long snow-laden hell, my mind kept going back to that day of dodging thunderstorms. I made it out of that nightmare alive and arriving at my destination before the storms overtook me by sticking to my training. Keep calm, avoid areas of limited visibility. Use everything I had to find the runway and get on the ground as quickly as possible. Strange as it sounds, remembering that brush with death at the hands of Mother Nature brought me some small amount of comfort. I made it out of that death trap alive, so I could surely make it through this one. Driving through a blizzard isn't a skill they teach at CDL school. However, the ability to operate in limited visibility on slick roads and high winds are all concepts included in the training. I had faced all three challenges before that night in a truck. This was simply the first time I had to deal with all three at once. Fortunately, all three problems required the same solution, slow down, maintain a stable speed, and avoid rapid change in speed and direction. It was something that my instructors at the school as well as my trainer had emphasized heavily. Fortunately for me and FK, I paid attention in class. I don't know exactly how long I pushed through that ice-covered nightmare. There were times when the truck felt as if it were about to give up and skid off the road only to oblige my corrections and keep going just a bit longer. Each time I came upon a bridge or overpass, my sphincter would tighten up so quick that it felt as though my butt cheeks were biting holes into the seat. Whenever the truck dropped into a small valley, the cross-current snow drifts resulted in a few, heart-stopping moments of complete blindness until the truck climbed out through the far side. With each passing moment, a new threat presented itself, and each time, I did my best to push through. Call it skill, luck, relentless stubbornness, or divine intervention. One guess would be as good as the other. Regardless, with less than 10 miles left until reaching the company's main terminal, the blizzard had finally begun to tire itself out. The snow continued to fall in heavy sheets, but the wind had abetted to more manageable level and the visibility improved dramatically. As the remote countryside gave way to the outermost edges of the town, white and orange streetlights revealed what resembled a post-apocalyptic cityscape. Every store, gas station, and restaurant was dark and empty as if the entire town had been evacuated. When I finally pulled into that terminal parking lot, set the truck brakes, and put myself off duty, I didn't feel relieved or grateful. In fact, I don't remember feeling anything. I sat in the driver's seat for a good half hour, smoking a cigarette in an attempt to bring myself back from whatever trance I had fallen into. I watched the snow through the windshield while trying to come to grips with what had taken place of the past few hours. Winter had thrown everything it had at me and, despite even my own predictions, I made it out alive and in one piece. I didn't break out in tears, nor did I feel the need to shout in triumph. 
I was simply exhausted mentally and physically. When the need to pee came upon me, I got out of the truck. Being late at night, all of the offices and shops were closed, but the company maintained a 24-hour restroom and shower facility at the shop for drivers camped out at the terminal. However, at the moment I needed to make use of the facility, it was closed for cleaning. That is, there was a wet floor sign in the middle of the restroom, a chain across the door, and not a single living soul inside. The floor was covered with melted snow and dirt much like that on the bottom of my boots. No harm in soiling what's already dirty, I think, so I go inside and relieve myself. On the way out, as luck would have it, the shop assistant who had been assigned to clean that particular restroom came back from whatever had interrupted his job. When he saw me, he apparently took my trespass on his workspace as a personal affront. Hey, he said with tone that would make any Karen jealous, are you stupid? Can't you read the fucking sign? I, not missing a beat, reply, would you rather I stand at the door and piss on the floor, asshole? I was not in any mood to deal with a bad attitude at that point. The assistant gets into a huff. You damn drivers. I get so tired of your shit. He never finished his sentence as I, a good deal larger than him, got right in his face, looked him dead in the eye and raised a finger in warning. Don't fuck with me, shithead. Not tonight. I warn him. After the hell I just went through, I had no intention of allowing some self-important peon to tell me I couldn't relieve an empty bladder because my dirty boots would make his dirty floor even dirtier. Back outside, I light another cigarette and stand beneath the awning, watching the snow fall through the lamplights. Then, as is habit, I take out my phone. I see an unread email, it must have come during the drive and I didn't realize. It was from my fleet manager and I suddenly was reminded as to why I had made that nightmare of a journey. That email, I knew, would set the stage for the fight I had been waiting for. Where, when, who and what would be involved would be outlined in that message. For the past few days, I had considered every possible contingency of the meeting and felt more than ready. In my point of view, I held all the cards and controlled the terms, any threats or attempts at coercion and they would quickly find themselves in a world of hurt. I was ready for anything and opened the email. Opie, when you get to the terminal, move on to truck 3456 and meet with driver Bob ID 9123, not real name. We'll send instructions in the morning. FM. Okay, I wasn't ready for that. I wanted a new partner, true enough, but I had no idea they would move that quickly. I didn't know who Bob was or why I was being assigned to his truck. Maybe he did? One way to find out. I go back to the truck. FK had been asleep during the entire trip from Wisconsin to the terminal, just as well since any snarky comment from him during that blizzard might have been made with his last breath. Now he was wide awake and poring over the computer. Where are we? He asked. I go straight to the bunk and begin packing my gear. Main terminal. FM called me earlier and told me to get here right away. What's the deal? At this point, I could have let him in on what he might expect. However, I believe that finding oneself in a fair fight is a sign of poor tactics. I don't know, but I've been assigned to another truck. FK said nothing, he had been completely taken by surprise and had no idea what he was likely in for. Then again, neither did I. I expected to go a few rounds with safety the next morning and now I'm packing my bags for a new truck. FK simply got out of the truck and I never saw him again. I packed my belongings, left my key in the glove box, and left the truck for the last time. A few moments later, I'm knocking on the door of a new truck. Are you Bob? I asked the driver when he answers. Yeah, he said rubbing his eyes since I had just woke him up. Are you Opie? That's me. I reply and climb aboard. Sorry to wake you up. We just got here. At first, this doesn't register with him. Then he realizes what I just told him. Wait, you drove through that shit? I take a deep breath. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it if you're curious. You must be nuts, he said. You have no idea. I guess we're partners now, I say. Bob screws his face at me. No, he said, confused, my partner is waiting for me in Pennsylvania. I was supposed to leave out yesterday afternoon, but FM called and told me to wait for you. I figured you'd know what the deal was. I give him the basic rundown of what happened with my now former co-driver, how I reported him to safety and now relayed back to the main terminal. Damn, man, he replied, sounds like rough gig. Understatement of the year, I think. The next morning, the weather had broken. The sky was dull and threatened to bring more snow, but the wind had dulled to a gentle breeze. As soon as she was in the office, FM gave me a call. Hey, Opie, she said, sounding a bit nervous, where are you guys at? Sitting in the yard. Wait, she replied, sounding a little confused, you made it in last night. Sure did. What in God's name possessed you to drive through that storm? I take a deep breath. It would be best if I didn't elaborate on that point. 
She wanted to press for more information but decided not to. Aha, did you meet up with Bob and move to his truck? Sure did. What's the deal? You and Bob are gonna take a load to the terminal in Pennsylvania. His co-driver will meet him there. I'm gonna have you pick up another truck and we'll go from there. Okay, I respond cautiously. Am I gonna meet my new co-driver up there too? No, we haven't found you one yet. Just check in with me when you get there and we'll see what happens. No problem. We hang up and I fill Bob in on our new marching orders. The company's terminal in Pennsylvania was about a day and a half with two drivers. Fortunately, Bob had already picked up the load before the storm hit so all we had to do was to get rolling. Since the truck was permanently assigned to Bob and he had just finished his stint with his trainer, I offer him the first drive shift so he can get used the truck. As we head out I got to see the full impact from the previous night's storm. About 24 inches of snow had fallen in just under 12 hours. Every five minutes we saw cars spun out and abandoned in ditches and center medians. At nearly every overpass we came upon there was at least one vehicle that had lost control and collided with the barrier. There were even semis jackknifed and abandoned where they had hit deadly patches of black ice. Severe winter weather was common in this part of the country and even the local residents didn't fare well. When I saw the carnage from the very storm I traversed, I realized just how much danger I had been in and how lucky we had been that FK had not been the one driving. Holy shit, Bob said after we passed a semi that had left the road and was now laying on side, you drove through this? I take a deep breath. Yep. For being an inexperienced driver, Bob knew his stuff. For the first time since I finished my time with my trainer, I was riding with someone who actually knew what the hell they were doing. I had known Bob for only a few hours, but I felt more comfortable with him at the wheel than I ever did with FK, and I told him as much. We top off the tanks at the first fuel stop, I grab a bite of breakfast and head back to the bunk to rest up for my night shift. The rest of the trip to Pennsylvania, I'm happy to say, was uneventful. When Bob and I arrived at the Pennsylvania terminal, we say our goodbyes and I go sign out my new truck. I move aboard, store my belongings and log into the computer before sending a message to FM that I'm ready to go. An hour later, she sends me a load, pick up the next morning from a nearby shipper with delivery in Missouri. She says to expect a diversion back to the main terminal along the way, but she will let me know for sure before the time comes. I confirm the instructions and set the computer aside. For a long time, I sat in the driver's seat and looked around the truck. I was all alone, FK was a thousand miles away and, for the time being at least, I had won a battle with management before it had even started. And then, for a reason I can't fully explain, I started to laugh. Whether it was out of relief of simply submitting to the absurdity of the situation, it felt as though a huge burden had been lifted off of my shoulders and things were beginning to look up. I ended up taking the load all the way to Missouri alone. In fact, I worked solo for the next two weeks and all I can say is that IT was heaven. I felt in complete control, never had to worry about waking up on the shoulder of a highway, not getting an hour of sleep before being drugged out of bed to help FK out of another jam and no more having my head bounced off a cabinet because of a hard brake check. It was what I had hoped trucking would be and I was enjoying every minute of it. After a few days into my solo period, I get a surprise phone call from the last person I ever expected to hear from, FK was reaching out. Hey man, FK said, sounding less confrontational and, unless I was mistaken, anxiety, what are you up to? On my way to Texas, running solo? Cool. I need a favor. Okay. Can you call safety and tell them I said I had been in coma for 21 hours? What? I say shocked, you told me 21 days countless times. Look man, this is important. He then goes into a long, sob story. According to him, he and his wife went through nasty divorce. His wife had been granted full custody of their two kids. He also said that he had been to court and the judge ordered him to come back in a year with gainful employment or he would be sent to jail. I assume that it pertained to spousal or child support, though I don't know for certain. He signed on with the company because they were the only place that would hire him. Well, I reply, doesn't sound like something I can help with. But if safety calls, I'll see what I can do. Per bastard had no idea who put him in that position. I hung up and never heard from him again. I went about having the time of my life. Not only was I having the time of my life, the fact that I didn't have to waste so much time correcting FK's mistakes meant that I was able to make my pickups and deliveries on time, stay on course, and complete my loads without a single issue. In fact, I didn't need dispatch for anything more than sending load information. I didn't even talk to FM for a week and a half before she called me out of the blue. Hey, OB, she said, sounding a little curious, how's everything going? Hey, FM. 
Everything's going fine. What's up? Oh, nothing. She replied, relieved and now sounding rather chipper, I haven't heard from you in a while. Well, I say, trying to make it clear I was joking, no offense, but I haven't needed to call you. That's good to hear. When you and FK were together, he was calling me about once a day, needing directions, getting lost. Well, I'm not FK. No, you're not. Anyway, I'm gonna work on getting you home for a few days. I found you a co-driver and I'm gonna have you pick him up when you come back to work. He doesn't live too far from you. I'll admit I was disappointed by this news. I was thoroughly enjoying being on my own, but I also knew that solo assignments didn't last long. The company relied on expedited freight, loads with tight deadlines that required two drivers to make on I'm delivery. Running solo was only allowed as a short-term measure to allow trucks to keep working until a second driver could be found. A few days after the phone call from FM, I go home and spend four days sleeping in my own bed, sitting on my couch and watching my TV. Sounds pretty boring, I know, but after three months of hell with FK, there was nowhere else I wanted to be. The four days passed all too quickly and I was assigned to head back out on the road. I met up with my second co-driver, we'll call him NG for new guy. Like Bob, NG had just completed his month with a trainer and was ready to be a co-driver while less experienced was still competent enough driver. There's not much more I can say about NG, he and I were only partners for a couple of months before he decided to leave for a better job. He wasn't under the same contract as me and I didn't blame him for leaving, so we parted on good terms. By now, you're probably wondering what happened to FK? When did you and Safety have the battle royale? How much damage did the nuclear email actually do? Truth is, I was asking myself those very same questions for the two and a half months between the last time I saw FK and the time NG went on to greener pastures. I decided not to pry, thinking my little nuclear attack probably painted a target on my back and discretion was the better part of valor. After all, I got what I wanted, FK was long gone as far as I was concerned and no matter what he did, he was someone else's problem. Was I curious? Sure, just not enough to stretch my neck and find out. When NG left, I found myself back in the same position I had been in before, no suitable co-driver was available. By this time, the company had begun to crack down on solo drivers and I was routed back to the main terminal until something could be figured out. The day I arrived back at the main terminal, I meet with FM to go over my options. Before that, however, she pulls me into another office with the safety director. When I see the name plaque on the door, a cold chill ran up my spine. It wasn't the battle I had been waiting for. In fact, the reason they wanted to meet me had nothing to do with the nuclear email, they offered me a promotion to lead driver. At first, I wasn't sure that I wanted to deal with more idiot drivers after barely surviving FK, but the only other option was to bounce from truck to truck until a permanent co-driver could be found, a prospect I found equally uncomfortable. I asked for a little time to think about it, and they oblige. I gave my old trainer a call to get his advice. My trainer and I stayed in touch to this and became good friends. He suggested I go for it since I would be the boss and could, within reason, boot a bad student off the truck if he proved too dangerous. I hadn't considered that and ultimately decided to take the job. Later that afternoon, I was back in FM's office getting paperwork ready for my new job. While we were waiting for safety to approve the promotion, I decide to ask. What's FK been up to? FM buries her face in her hands. Those five words had reopened a nasty wound. Trying to control her frustration, she told me what happened after I left with Bob to Pennsylvania. While I was sent on what was a vacation by comparison, FK had been tasked with completing the load we had picked up in Lewiston. However, in typical FK fashion, he got lost almost as soon as he left terminal. He had gotten so far off course that the GPS locator on the truck couldn't even be found by dispatch. It took him an entire day to get back on track only to do the exact same thing twice before finally making delivery two days late. The next day, they sent him another load assignment but had to cancel it because he couldn't find the pickup location despite the fact it was less than a mile away. It was at that point the safety decided to pull him back in until they could get to the bottom of the situation. When he got lost again on the way back, they had him leave the truck in a truck stop and catch a ride with another truck. Why did they send him back out after the nuclear email? While I never got a solid confirmation, the rumor is that the safety department used it as an experiment just to see if my claims had any merit. Needless to say, they find out real quick I wasn't bullshitting them. If they didn't believe that FK was a menace before, they couldn't deny it now. The question was what to do with him. They pulled FK in for a meeting to get to the bottom of the issue. 
When asked about why he kept getting lost, he maintained that he was following the company route. They then asked about why he couldn't find a shipper less than a mile away, he said he was waiting for the company to send directions. As the meeting wore on, FK became more and more worrisome. In his opinion, it was the job of the dispatch office to tell him every move to make, something that utterly impossible since one dispatcher was often charged with dozens of other trucks and couldn't be expected to babysit each of them. Drivers have to be able to work out issues for themselves and think on their feet when problems arise. FK wasn't able to be independent and whenever the situation required it of him, he ended up in trouble. Everything that took place lead to one irrefutable conclusion, FK was either medically or mentally unfit to operate a commercial vehicle. They had dug into the claim about the 21-day coma but found no mention of it in his paperwork. Despite the fact that two credible witnesses provided corroborating accounts, it wasn't in his file. When they questioned him, he denied it at first but a brief investigation discovered the truth, it was a 21-day coma. How did FK manage to slip through the cracks, get a CDL and go for four months before being caught? In simple terms, he lied. In order to get a CDL, one must have a DOT medical certificate. Part of the process of getting that certificate is completing a rather lengthy questionnaire about medical history, drug or alcohol dependency, illnesses, medical conditions, etc. One of these questions asked the applicant to describe any brain or neurological injury or condition. Another, more generic and subjective question asked if the applicant had any other condition that would interfere with the safe operation of commercial motor vehicle. FK, like all other new hires, received a DOT physical soon after he arrived at the training facility where he filled out the questionnaire form, a form that is controlled by the federal government and, per regulation, the company retained on file. As it happened, FK had not told the medical examiner about the coma. When they asked him about it, he had tried to backpedal and say it was 21 hours, but when they checked his medical records, I don't know how they did this without violating confidentiality laws, they learned that it was, in fact, 21 days. And with that, FK's fate was sealed. He had lied on a government document and obtained a medical certificate and CDL through fraudulent means. After realizing this, the company had not choice but to report the incident to the Department of Transportation. The DOT, in turn, revoked FK's medical certificate, rendering his CDL invalid. This was also reported to the DMV of the state that issued his license and, per state law, the state also revoked his CDL, the company had no choice but to fire him. FK had sabotaged his own driving career on day one. FM, after telling all this, admitted she had her doubts about him early on due to an incident that happened just before he and I paired up. He was running solo and was supposed to deliver a load in Indianapolis. For whatever reason, FK couldn't find the receiver and, according to GPS pings, actually drove around in circles for two full days before someone noticed and asked what was going on. When they finally had the issue straightened out, they noticed that, during the entire two-day period, FK was less than two miles from the delivery point, driving around in circles. FM had hoped that another partner would straighten him out, but when it was clear that wasn't happening, all she could do was apologize to me. But the story doesn't end with FK destroying his own career. I made a few friends in the company's head office who were there when the nuclear email hit and, over a period of several months, I was able to piece together the full story and fallout of the nuclear email. Bear in mind, it is mostly second-hand information, but they claimed it to be true. After being informed of FK's fraud, the DOT wanted to know how someone like him could slip through so easily. When asked how the issue was discovered, the company showed my email to the DOT who, in turn, went ballistic. The company, hoping to avoid being prosecuted for negligence, cooperated by conducting an internal audit of the company's policies and procedures. They found several serious shortcomings in many departments right down to the recruiter who processed and approved FK's application. Apparently, the application was approved before a basic MVR motor vehicle report was completed. The MVR showed no fewer than four accidents on FK's record where he was at fault within the past three years, one was enough to disqualify him. However, it was later discovered that recruiters were often encouraged or coerced to overlook such things and simply get people to sign up and get them to the training facility. Apparently, this was to take advantage of a government hiring incentive, despite the fact that drivers weren't oftenly hired until after completing CDL school. Additionally, the Hours of Service Compliance Department, whose job it was to monitor driver logs and handle violations, had failed to act whenever FK, among many other drivers, violated the HOS regulations. 
The reasoning for this, so they claimed, is that they were overwhelmed with correcting errors in driver logs made by improperly trained drivers. As a result, they were only allowed to issue notices of non-compliance when the computer flagged consistent violations. Even the safety department found itself under fire when it was revealed that their own people were telling new drivers not to make use of important safety features on the truck, namely engine brakes. This became such a concern that, according to rumor, safety director himself sat in on a new hire orientation and, upon hearing the presenter actively discourage the use of engine brakes, removed the presenter from the class on the spot and demanded the orientation course be overhauled as soon as possible. In the end, it came down to the safety personnel being reminded that they were not drivers and had no business giving their opinions in place of facts. The last department to take a major hit was training. After reviewing the company's accident history, it became very clear that many new drivers were not properly trained in several key areas. In order to shorten their time at the training facility, the company preferred to teach students the bare minimum to pass the CDL test and rely on lead drivers to fill in the gaps. The problem with this system was that there was very little in the way of a standardized rubric by which a student driver's skills could be assessed. Essentially, lead drivers were left to their own devices when training students. Whether or not the student passed or failed was, for the most part, dependent on the lead driver's subjective assessment. There were other issues that were uncovered during the audit that are quite technical, but suffice to say, the company had a lot of problems that needed to be fixed and quick. Despite this, the DOT agreed to withhold prosecution under the condition that the problems were to be fixed within a set period of time. I heard rumors that a few people were fired due to negligence, but I have way of confirming that. I can only assume that things improved because the company is still in operation to this day. As for me, I finished out my eight-month contract as lead driver. When the contract was fulfilled, I leased a truck under the company's independent contractor program in order to make more money, that was the idea, at least. I did that for several months before growing tired of their mismanagement and left to work for another company. I drove long haul for another year before deciding to move into sectors that allowed me to have more of a life outside of a truck cab. Today, I'm fortunate to work for a fantastic outfit that really appreciates its employees and allows me to be home every night and on weekends. As for the ultimate fate of FK, I can't say with any real certainty. Despite everything, I don't hate him. I hope he was able to get the help he needed and turn his life around. If so, then at least some good would have come of everything that happened. And with that, the saga of FK comes to an end. For those of you that have followed the story since the beginning, I honestly hope that you don't find this ending a disappointment and worth the time and torturous cliffhangers I have, albeit reluctantly, have subjected you to. And this concludes the final episode of Kevin in a Big Rig. Thanks for listening and consider dropping me a subscribe if you made it this far. Till next time, CYA.